Good afternoon, humans. All right. Let's make some noise. Let's hear some noise. Let's get some heat. This is our last but not least session of Industry Week 2022. So give me a bit more heat. Oh, yeah. Amazing stuff. So, folks, as we come to... I'm not going to say come to a close because we've got some, a couple of hours of some amazing content coming up. But as we come to a close, I just want to have a little bit of a moment to reflect on this week because it's been pretty intense, right? We've had talks from all different types of guests, different backgrounds, different roles. And I want, it, I want you to have a think about how that's going to impact, obviously, your, your learning journey moving forwards, what you're going to be doing. Uh, thinking about subject specialisms, thinking about your next step in education, whatever that might be, okay? Ensure you give yourself the opportunity to reflect on that and think about it. And as we move into the next talk, um, let's level up and let's think about the next stages, okay? So, post with the most. I've said it all week, um, all right? Make sure you smash the hashtag IW2022 or IW22. Get your post on, get your image on. Okay, and someone's going to win that £50 Amazon voucher. It'd be great if it was one of our esports guys, right? That'd be amazing. Okay, folks. So, the format of today is we're going to have an amazing one hour of conversation. Start prepping some questions, thinking about all of the different things that you might have to ask with regards to esports and esports production. Um, following that, we're going to have a few hours of workshop, uh, similar to uh, the format that we had yesterday, but with so much... Um, so much action and so much involvement. So we're really, really excited to, uh, to give you the opportunity to be a part of this. To introduce our guest, I'd like you to show some love and some serious, serious noise. Make some noise for our guest from the States, from Indianapolis, J.D. Wu. Thank you. Welcome, JD. Welcome to uh, welcome to sunny Nottingham. It's so beautiful here. Right now. <laughs> yes, it is not. Okay, so um, yeah, welcome to uh, welcome to Notts and welcome to the UK. Uh, can we start off by giving a little bit of an introduction into uh, who is JD Wu? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, hi, I'm JD Wu. Um, I am an esports director, technical director. Um, I know that the term technical director is a little means a little bit different uh, to all the different parts of the world, um, but to describe what I do, I am a person in a gallery. That's what y'all call it here. Um, we call it a control room uh, in the United States. Um, so I am a person in the front row, calling cameras, directing all the different aspects of the floor. Um, and also hidden buttons and um, going to all the different uh, signals that are coming through the gallery or control room. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what I do, uh, who, I'm, who I am as a person. I play video games, um, I cook, and I am a cat dad of three. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to kind of reverse some of the formatting because usually we'll go through very specific questions about job and role and everything. And we're going to start a little bit more personal because you spoke about some games and you spoke about a couple of little other bits. Um, what games do you play? Uh, just Elden Ring right now. J only Elden Ring. Um, I do play a lot of, uh, I do play a wide range. So I was um, definitely during the start of the pandemic, you know, I'm sure all of us were playing a decent amount of Animal Crossing, but yeah, pretty much, you know, Animal Crossing, Elden Ring, anywhere in between those two <laughs> ends of gaming, uh, all of it. I think um, the most important question is, do you play any Street Fighter? I used to. That's good enough for me. Fantastic. We can continue <laughs> the interview. That works. Um, what games do you watch? Yeah. Um, so in terms of just games I watch, it's been, it's been Elden Ring. Um, but yeah, it's, it pretty much is, you know, um, just kind of like the flavor of what people are playing and all the different um, entertainers and streamers are playing. Those are the games I watch. 
um, to kind of branch off of that into uh, esports. Um, pretty much any of the big tournaments that are happening. Um, if I had to give a favorite for um, my favorite broadcast of esports, it was probably the Dota um, Animator by We Play, I believe. Um, I thought that that was like one of my one of the my most like favorite uh, tournaments to watch, um, and I felt like it was just like the perfect theme, perfect vibe, per perfect energy for what the demographic of the viewership was. Um, and of when it comes to just like, you know, turning on, uh, you know, eSports uh, stream, it's been a lot of Rainbow Six Siege. I love it. I feel like it's a, um, what the developers and what uh, Ubi has done with the spectator client. It's something that is just like, uh, it's just really, it's really, really nice to see um, that kind of support into um, how to tell a story within the game and showing that to the viewership. Definitely. And yeah, big fan of that, uh, the, the We Play Animator, those finals, they were amazing. L lovely technology, a great example of innovation yeah. uh, for an online, uh, for a broadcast. Um, so let's jump into uh, questions regarding the land of electronic sports. I hate that term, but I want to use it now. Cyber I'm going to use it for the cringe, right? Esports, let's get it right. No hyphen, no capital S, right? Um, when did you learn about esports? That, that question is a really hard question to ask because I was aware of like competitive games for, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I would, I think when Pokemon, Pokemon Red and Blue came out, I went to a tournament for that, and like that technically was an eSport tournament. Um, but I think at the time, like we just don't have a word for it. We're just like, oh, we're playing games and it's a tournament. So um, that was probably like my first, I think, exposure to like, I guess what eSports is. Um, but I guess in terms of the, the eSports we know it is, know of it as uh, today, it was um, me and a ragtag bunch of people on the internet doing uh, go for lols. Um, Amazing. Yeah, uh, I think it was, uh, it, you know, it was the wild west of esports, you know, I don't know, it was not relatively long ago, I'm not super ancient, um, but it was, uh, it was like a 14 hour day of competing for uh, $20 if you win or something like that. So Mega it was a, uh, it was it was a uh, it was really prestigious title, you know. Um, but that's uh, that was probably my first kind of dip into what I think we associate with like modern esports. Fantastic, um, kind of connected in a way in that b before you was officially engaged in esports for employment and or for that sort of interest was this something that you was interested in before yeah i think um for for most people who are um who love video games like you always want to be someone who makes video games um but as you kind of like as i got older and stuff you know i realized that i might not be the smartest person to let's say make video games but um i found that i had plenty of other interests. So um, I was very much into uh, cinematography and film. Um, so that's actually what I went to university for. I went to University of Iowa, very prestigious film school. Um, but I went to there for cinema and I did my studies uh, through that. And um, while I was also at the university, I was um, competing um, in professional League of Legends. At the time, it was probably more so like um, amateur professional, because it's hard to balance uh, school and long hours of gaming. I'm sure plenty of you are aware of that. Amazing indeed. My long hours of gaming have long gone now with children, but um, I'm sure these guys know what exactly what it's about, the heat of battle. Um, jumping into um, esports production, working in esports production, and kind of skirting around it just a little bit, actually, to begin with. Uh, knowing that background in cinematography, photography, video, 
Um, what kind of transferable skills did you carry from um, that industry into, I say that industry, but that area of this industry into esports? Yeah, it's um, so my one of my one of the I guess the best way to kind of talk about the bridge between um, me going to university for cinema is I guess the first step I had in the esports production uh, industry, and um, it was a broadcast observer. So um, taking the learnings that I had from cinema, whether it's you know just um, telling a story within the frame and applying that to um, the in-game world, um, creating suspense, doing all of those things as a, in, like, as a gameplay observer, which is something that, um, it's a, it, we all know that observing is definitely a very um, unique skill. Um, so kind of taking that, um, storytelling, all the different techniques uh, within cinema, um, you know, building that story within the frame, that's like one of the biggest skills. And um, just kind of, uh, I think, just a very general skill of just uh, storytelling mindset. It makes perfect sense, absolutely. Um, jumping into your role as TD, can you break down a typical event as a TD in terms of uh, what you do to prepare? and then what you do during the actual broadcast. Yeah, um, so leading up to an event, if it's like a fresh event with no um, pre-built uh, workflows or any other preset workflow that you're, I'm kind of being integrated into, if it's a fresh event, it'll be meeting with producers, meeting with creatives about what the expectations are of how it looks, how that we want it to feel and taking that taking that direction and creating a visual creating a feel creating um an energy to the event and then um just a lot of meetings to be as aligned as possible leading into the eventual live event with regards to the events themselves which titles i know we've mentioned a few games but which titles have you worked on as part of uh, an esports event yeah, um, so it uh, there's a lot of titles. Um, just to kind of list, like the ones that I'm sure all you are aware of is League of Legends. Um, so I worked with Riot Games. I was uh, full time with them for my early start of uh, esports directing and technical directing. And then I worked uh, more into a freelance to uh, work on different titles, work on different games. And I've worked on um, Madden, which is uh, American football, um, and uh, Apex Legends, uh, FIFA, and Call of Duty, um, just to list a few, yeah. Yes, uh, quite a wide range of games, that's amazing. Oh, and which events have you worked on outside of esports? Yeah, um, so uh, definitely one of the biggest things is networking um, when it comes to uh, like live production. So to do that, you kind of need to do some outside of esports events. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the events were corporate, some of the events were entertainment, awards, things like that. So it was. Um, just to list a couple, uh, there's a corporate um, thing that I was doing. It was uh, with Salesforce Live, and it's just kind of doing um, almost like a big corporate uh, like event with presentations and having all of the um, leadership give um, great information to the rest of the company and any of the partners involved. Um, and then also doing, um, I did a uh, billboards, women in music awards. Um, that was a really fun one. Always interesting, and the catering is always good for those ones because you're eating the food that you know very successful people uh, are eating. Um, and then just doing a couple of nice premieres. There was a, I think I did a, it was a Sony, Sony Entertainment's uh, Bad Boys for Life movie premiere. So. 
that was fun. You get to see it's always it's always a, a interesting experience doing uh, any of the things kind of um, within the entertainment world. Did you meet Will Smith? I didn't. <laughs> I got to see him though, which is like amazing. Absolutely, that's, I'll, I'll take that as a win. <laughs> Indeed. Um, which do you prefer, working in esports or doing some of these different events? Or if there's a comparison that you can make, uh, which one would you prefer? I think I, I would say esports. Uh, I think that I just who I am as a person at the core is I'm I love games. So what can I say? Um, so being in esports, being um, surrounded by people who also probably play games, it's a great environment to be in. Um, yeah, it's always a, I feel like the energy in the room, the energy around the whole event. It's something that I can. Um, like resonate with so much. Has there been an event where you've like, you've had to moderate the fanboying um, due to the the talent? Um, Players. There, I think early on, early on, it's it's really hard to you know, um, to not to like avoid those things because I know that when I when I first started, you know. Um, at Riot, it was, uh, I was like walking down the hall to, you know, to the observer room when you get ready for the show or whatever. And then I see like, you know, Freak walk down the hallway and I'm like, that's <laughs> him. He's a human being. Um, so just to see that, it's like, you definitely have those moments of kind of freaking out and, and stuff. But as it's kind of, as you kind of just get more used to just seeing that people are just people and they, they play games too, and they're <laughs> they're just another human being, just excited to work and be a part of something amazing. Um, that has really uh, it's like humble. It's humbled me a lot, and um, it's made me realize that you know we all we all just want to do something really cool. That's amazing, indeed, um, and hopefully that's the same reason all these human beings are sitting here. They want to do something cool. Um, Jumping into the actual broadcast and the engagement in broadcasts themselves, how do you deal with unexpected problems? Definitely deal with them. Um, I think um, one of the one of the most important things when something goes unexpected in the wide range of things that can go wrong, especially within esports, because there's so there's just so many more signals that are happening in esports. It's one of the, s not to be, not to say like things are scary, but it's one of the scariest places to be in terms of a technical troubleshooting realm because so many things, so many point, there's so many points of failure. Um, but one of the most important things is if something does go wrong, just keep a cool head. Um, it's good to identify when what your uh, when you're giving information about what's going wrong and what's where it could be, it's something that uh, is applies to you and just try create a calm, very streamlined environment to give feedback, give information while keeping things as calm and as clear as possible over um, lines of communication. Amazing, and that's that's actually beautifully answered the following question as well that I had, so that's really nice. Just talking about high pressure environments and how yeah. to engage in those. I think it's so important to be able to hold your hold your ground, hold your mind, and stay ca calm and collected, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, especially when it's like, um, you have like, uh, people, all, all kinds of people have varying ways of responding to a situation that when it's especially in a high pressure environment, um, it's good to remind yourself that the way people act in that moment in time is just a, re a natural response to help fix the problem. So whether someone is panicking or whether someone's screaming or whether someone's absolutely checked out from the moment um, mm -hmm. and overwhelmed, uh, it's good to remind yourself that you're all just trying to fix the problem and just stay calm, don't th take things personally, and it'll, 
the problem will be solved when the problem solved. And feeding into that, maybe a, sm a small step outwards looking at some of those broader skills, what kind of characteristics do you look for in people working as part of a production crew? Definitely, um, I would say passionate. I think that um, one of the biggest things um, I really like to see in people like surrounding me is that you care. I think that's one of the biggest things, no matter like, because we all, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all know that when we're watching a tournament, the tournament runs for a long time. There's like long hours you're in, uh, in you're in a pretty mm. like closed environment with other individuals, and just to be surrounded by people who are passionate um, helps kind of keep that energy going throughout the day. keeps have keeps you uh, having fun, keeps you engaged in the story which is um, one of the most, I think, challenging things is like, we all love video games and we all love like esports. Um, but to take that love and keep, take that um, passion and go for 12 hours straight could be, it's a challenge. And one of the best characteristics is just being passionate um, and being thoughtful. That's definitely one of the ones. Absolutely. And it's not like in esports you have to work long hours or anything, is it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, what's the best way for students to present their portfolio of work to employers? Yeah. Um, this, is, this is probably one of the more like difficult things, I guess, to, and probably one of the most important things to learn is how do I take you know all this like volunteer work? How do I take all of this um, stuff I've been doing and just show people that I can do it? Um, and the most important thing is make a reel. Um, make a reel as you go as you do projects. Write down a list of all the things you've done. Um, it's so important to track what you do. Um, not just for yourself to see how far, how much you've done, which is like I think a really good thing to help keep yourself um, motivated and keep yourself like really happy with what you're doing is track all the things you do, make a reel, and also make posts. And we all know the internet has a bunch of things on it, and that's just a thing you can throw onto the internet, and it will follow you and it comes up in Google searches, all that stuff. Brilliant. I think with with work in mind, with showreels in mind, one of the um, challenging questions to answer that we come across quite a lot um, is based on how do you transition from uh, volunteering to paid work and what advice do you have to students going through that? Yeah. Um, it's it's so funny that uh, like I first of all I love the question because it's a question that um, I uh, like I ask myself a lot of times like what do I like how how do people even um, go from doing something that they love and doing something to doing something that they love and get paid for it um, and I think one of the best things to keep in mind is you have to take all this volunteer experience and create create a reel most like most importantly is creating some sort of visual that can be given to um, a production company given to um, a interviewer for a position um, just so that they can see what you do and I think more, more importantly, is just getting experience um, in fields that aren't necessarily esports. And I know that this is like a weird place to say, don't do esports at a, at a talk for about esports production. But there's a lot of skills and a lot of really, really talented people who aren't in esports production 
and there's plenty of paying jobs that will take people who do who know of like production in general um and it's a great way to network into um esports production there's so many people that i've met outside of esports who know someone who knows someone or who knows someone who can lead you into an eventual esports gig and i think that one of the most important things is giving yourself the opportunity to have more chances to get it in to esports production and i think that um it's to always try to um, go from like, I want to volunteer in esports to like directly into esports production. Like you need to, I, do, I don't want to like scare people off by saying you need to be lucky, but you need to just, uh, it, it, there is a certain level of like luck to get into it. That's why we all want to work in esports production. It's an amazing thing that we all care about. Um, so giving yourself more opportunities, more, more connections into uh, opening um, within the esports ecosystem is probably one of the most um, important things that makes sense, but it also it's it's hard to make that connection to be like, oh, I want to work in esports. Why didn't I sign up for this football <laughs> production that's yeah. happening? You're totally right, and I think one of the the fundamentals of confetti, and I'm, this isn't to start plugging confetti, but the idea is to connect them up while they're studying. So it's so important to know any industry you go into they say it's not what you know it's who you know it's a combination of both isn't it you have yeah. to know people it is very nepotistic uh, but at the same time it's you you have to be opportunistic opportunistic that's the word i'm going to use that opportunist you have yes. to be an opportunist um, in all of these instances as well a, a question that connects with um the, the answer and i think it's it's also a quite a challenging question from the student's perspective in that how do you uh, a measure, qualify, quantify self-worth uh, into uh, what's my uh, my daily rate, what's my hourly rate, how much should I charge for this event? Yeah, that's um, that's a very difficult, they're very very difficult question. Um, I think one of the most important things is to know what the standard is. Mm -hmm. I think not saying you know walk up to everybody you see and ask them how much they're getting paid um for a gig but um having conversations with peers in the industry is probably one of the most important uh steps you can take in terms of gauging what value you bring and where where your worth is um as an individual and like what you bring to the table um so much of the the uh power of like knowing what you are worth is transparency and being vulnerable and having some kind of uncomfortable conversations um so yeah definitely being as transparent as possible and also have opening up those conversations with uh all your peers and like-minded people mm -hmm. um and seeing what the standard is spectacular absolutely I think a lot of it is that transparency, putting yourself out there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so as we start to come towards the, the, the final questions, um, what kind of, if there was a software, hardware, or something that students should really aim to get hold of or to engage with um, in your years of experience uh, working within esports and in and around esports, what kind of gear do you think students should get their hands on early days and at home and to practice and refine their skills in? Um, so especially for um, eSports production, uh, I would definitely recommend everybody look into vMix. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with vMix already and have heard of vMix. Um, it's uh, at the start of the pandemic, everybody was trying to figure out any kind of solution to like make a show that isn't like a PowerPoint. Um, and a lot of people, it was a big learning process for a lot of production companies. And I would say something that is like so amazing is that you can, 
and by no means this is is this like a advertisement for vmix or whatever but um you can get a free trial <laughs> this is totally so is sounding like an advertisement for vmix this is not a this is not a paid advertisement for vmix um you can get a free trial of vmix and what you're capable of doing is the same quality the same um standard that's been set by broadcasts that have tens of thousands of viewers and you can do that on your computer if you can run what uh what's the what's the game that um uh cr what is it uh, cr uh yeah if you can run crisis 3 you can run vmix um vmix 4k um so luckily we do all of our streams using ms teams so no. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely, definitely a free. There's, it's a free trial of Emix, and then if you want to spend money on it, and learn more and practice it more, definitely go for it. I would say that that's for software. I would say for hardware, if you're learning things and learning about, especially for someone kind of starting off at home, with I'm not gonna say go buy a video production switcher for you know fifty thousand dollars. Um, but I think a Stream Deck is a great start, too. I think what you can do on a Stream Deck uh, in plenty of the workflows that exist, you can, you can effectively run a, a really high-quality broadcast that um, with just a Stream Deck and just a free trial of vMix. So definitely give those, give those a shot. Um, Awesome. Before I um, open it up to the crowd to be able to ask uh, ask their questions, um, what pearls of wisdom, what um, bit of advice that you want every student to cling on to and take with them today? If there was one thing, and I'm sure there's many things, and there have yeah. been many things already, but what one thing would you want to um, give to the students who are embarking on a journey into a now booming, growing, nuts industry um, for them to innovate, stand out? Yeah, um, I think my, my one thing that I think has been um, extremely important in terms of uh, my, my own personal growth and what peop what value people see in me when they bring me onto a project is be a really good human being and be a thoughtful human being and be a very mindful human being because there's so many talented people in this world um, and it's a scary it's the competition to be able to execute on this is like very high there's so many talented people out there but one of the biggest things that people really care about at the end of the day is how did it feel getting through your broadcast? How did it, what was the process like um, instead of the results? So being very mindful about how can I make everyone's day around me better how, without, you know, being like, you know, too extra or whatever, but being a very mindful human being, being very thoughtful about your interactions with all the people around you is like such a valuable thing because people will see that um, in a 12 hour day of broadcast and they'll be like, you know, today was a pretty good day. Even though it was like a 12 hour grueling, no commercial breaks. But if you had a bunch of really nice people around you, you'll remember all those nice people and you'll want to see more of them. You want to be around them more. So be a, be a nice person, be a thoughtful person, and be cool. <laughs> what a spectacular answer, right? Folks, can you join me in celebrating this session with a really warm and exciting <laughs> round of applause? <laughs> Thanks so much, JD. Um, we'll open up to questions. I'm going to leave the stage um, to yourself, JD, and over to you, crowd. Let's see some hands. What are the name of your cats? The name of my cats. Um, I so they go by a bunch of different names. Of 
course, as as pets do. They have like five, like ten different names, but their legal cat names are um, one is Rick, the other one is Maria, and then the other one is Eve. Three cats. It's a lot. I heard as I went into the crowd. Well, that's my question gone. So that's like <laughs> sorry <laughs> from at least five <laughs> sources. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Rick, uh, oh my gosh, this is, I hope this is uh, definitely getting posted all over the internet. Um, so, so Rick, his, his, my favorite nickname for him, it's, it's a little bit of a doozy, but it's uh, Ricky, Mickey, Maso, Matos, and Tomatoes. Um, and then Maria, um, we, ju we just call her Mama. She's the oldest. She's a very motherly figure. Um, and then Eve is, uh, we, we call Eve Doug. <laughs> so, so that's her nickname. No con, it, Amazing. You know, it, yeah, it, it always evolves from one thing to another, but her nickname is, Eve's nickname is Doug. Spectacular. Hi. Um, uh, first of all, I was wondering if you uh, followed the Hawkeyes games while you were at Iowa at all. I did. I did follow the Hawkeyes games. Um, did you attend them? I did attend a couple of them. A lot of the times I was staying in because uh, I naturally like to be inside <laughs> as an individual. But uh, I did. I did go out to uh, Kinnick Stadium for a couple of the football games and stuff like that. And um, what do you yeah. feel about the um, the atmosphere of a stadium like that um, with obviously so many passionate people um, compared to a, an eSports um, production? Um, so, great, great question. Um, I would say the energy is about, I would say it's very comparable. I, th I think that like the college bunch is a little bit more rowdier um, for college uh, American football. It's a little bit rowdier, a little bit more louder. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised um, if, it, if in terms of decibels, in terms of the actual output and maximum volume made would be about the same uh, for uh, um, an esports event. Um, I know that um, when we did Paris uh, for League of Legends, that crowd was like unbelievably loud. Um, at not all the time, but you know, when a wild moment is happening, um, it definitely gets just just as loud. Um, which is a uh, it's a great feeling just to feel that energy and just to you know sitting at your sitting at like a you know sitting in the control room or gallery um and just having like the room shake from the sh just the volume of people um it's a really amazing experience and it's it's scary at first but it's um i would say it's like exact same energy um but all the peaks of volume and energy it, it varies um a little bit. Uh, just one more question. Um, you said uh, a piece of advice would to be um, to make a reel. Um, so for someone that's in backroom production, um, uh, you know, TDing, vision mixing, something like that. How how would you um, advise to go about that process? Because um, personally, I don't know. I find it weird to to make a reel about oh, I changed from one scene to another scene. Yes. Like, yes. Um, Excuse me. Um, a a good thing to do on your reel, especially as you know, a vision mixer, a TD, whatever you want to call it, the person calling up the effects and going to the thing. Um, it's it's good to just show what effects you can execute. So things like timelines, uh, pushes and squeezes, or any of the any of the effects. I think. As this it it might seem silly to do because you're just like oh I'm just doing what I I'm just showing what I what, what I do I go to this one effect or whatever, um, 
I think a lot of a lot of people would be surprised that like if you can do um, esports production, if you can, if you're vision mixing for an esports production and doing all these different effects, the the depth to your knowledge on the switcher or production uh, software is it's so much more challenging to do effects within esports because you're generating the field of play and you're cr you're compositing so many different signals that a lot of people would be very impressed even if you think it's like oh this is just like a replay effect with a pip or something people will see that and they'll be like very impressed i think inside the esports world it's almost like a standard you have a replay and then there's a pip inside the replay of like what's happening in the live game but i think um outside of esports and just looking at general live production, that's like a effect that people would be like, nice, that looks good, that looks amazing. So I think just just showing those kind of things, any effects that you do, um, or even when it comes to any of the exciting moments and um, pacing, that's also a good thing to show that like, you know, you're a part of something that um, demonstrates, you know, uh, like high amounts of focus. I think that that's also a very valuable thing to show in a reel. Um, as someone who's uh, actually considered wanting to go to a university in America, what like li what's like the standard of life there? And would you recommend someone from England going to America for university? You said the standard of life. Yeah, just like what, like just what it, what it's like, really. Like, is it a nice place to be? Um. So definitely, when you're crossing streets, look the opposite way that you normally would. That is one thing coming from America to here. I I've definitely put myself in danger a lot um, by looking the wrong way. Um. But all jokes aside, definitely, um, I'm not sure, I don't have too much visibility and too much knowledge of how life is here and how uh, university and studying and um, uh, being a young adult here is. But I would say it's overall comparable. Um, but I would say, um, Definitely be prepared to try to uh, drive and commute a bunch. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hope I hope that was a good answer. Okay, it's quite difficult to answer, isn't it? The whole of America. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so you mentioned that VMix was a good starting point for esports broadcasts. Um, are there any other software packages specifically for home broadcasts and small scale broadcasts that you'd recommend looking into? Yeah. Um, I think we, as as most of us are aware of what vMix is, um, I'm sure even more of us are aware of what OBS is. Um, and if OBS Studio is a very capable um, software to do the same things as vMix. Um, it, it definitely has its things, um, and I'm sure um, for the people out there who have worked a bunch with OBS, there are things uh, that you need to be very cognizant of when you're working within it. But in terms of um, production software, I would say OBS is another um, alternative uh, for um, a remote at-home production. JD, um, broadcast standards have been in place for traditional broadcast TV, so on and so forth, for quite some time. Where do you think we are with esports with regards to broadcast standards? How, how close do you, do you think we are? Or do you think we'll, we'll achieve that in the next coming years? I think... Um, the standards for esports um, 
so I'm I'm only I guess I'm only speaking from my my perspective and my experience and um, projects that I've been working on and stuff. But I would say that esports production is almost trailblazing um, in live production when it comes to um, the technology involved um, in how uh, productions are done. Um, so. Just to give more context is, um, I do a lot of work for um, Riot Games, for League of Legends, um, so for like Worlds and MSI, those inter big international events. Um, the amount of technology uh, put into all of that to make that work is, um, and the scope of it is just so massive um, because just to kind of uh, say what I do uh, in terms of that is I work on the world feed for League of Legends, which means the camera, we're, we're pretty much, the world feed is the team that's on site at the venue doing all of the compositing of the game, of the live player shots, any of the um, highlights, B-roll, all those of player arrivals, um, teams talking in their huddle rooms, um, pretty much all of that stuff is getting sent through the world feed um, to all of the international partners. And uh, it's being sent in a ridiculously um, easy and quick, um, and thoughtful um, workflow that works for so many different kinds of uh, partners, uh, whether they can't do anything on their production, uh, in their production control room or gallery, um, or they can do, uh, they're putting on a massive show. So the world feed will get sent to partners who are just pretty much playing out what the world feed is sending, or there's partners like, um, the the neo um, feed, which is you know the English feed, that you'll see uh, the people from LEC and the people from LCS that they're giving their commentary over, and that that's that's a whole different production crew that's taking that world feed, and that world feed is pretty much the base of what all these different broadcasts are being built on. Um, so it's to do that over. Um, uh, this this thing that's dark that's dark fiber where all these lines are getting sent through and it's all very reliable um, it's remarkable mm -hmm. the amount of support that can be given to all these different international partners um, uh, that you really don't get too much visibility on that's that's like it's really insightful both from a technical perspective and just from a just a general perspective. Um, sorry, I'm hogging the mic, guys. I got another question. Um, wh what kind of uh, what was your experience uh, connecting with the um, the, the cross reality stage produ production team? Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. That's one of the things that uh, is one of the big things that's been kind of pushed within these big. Uh, international events within esports. It's almost like a standard set is that there's some sort of AR or XR or VR, um, any of the R's. Um, and it's a very, it's a very long process. So from usually these projects and these ideas are a year before the actual event. So pretty much when last year's Worlds ended, we were already talking about what Next Worlds is going to be um, and already working on the whole scope of that project, set design, all that stuff. Um, so the, it's, such a, it's such a big scope of it and it's just constantly um, having meetings and uh, being aligned as much as possible um, for all these events. And it's a, to work with uh, AR is a very 
uncomfortable thing, but don't let that scare you because you just can't see it in person. So it's you just have to use your imagination on half of it. Um, but working within AR, it's it's a very uh, delicate process that needs it needs to be a very calculated thing, and that's why there's like such a big lead up in terms of pre-production leading up to it. Thank you. Um, you've worked full time at Riot, and you've also um, been freelance. And uh, first of all, which did you prefer? And then, secondly, as someone that is entering the industry, um, do you think it would be better to get a, a wide range of experience by working freelance or settle down with a singular company? Um, great question. Um, so I, and also. Um, yeah, really, really good question. Um, so yeah, the, I, I did start as a full-time contractor, eventually full-time salary um, at Riot. And then from uh, there, I went to freelance, just to give context to everybody. Um, I would say, I, it's hard to say that which one I prefer because I think both have their value. I think when you're full-time and you're with a company s just dedicated, you can do a lot of uh, craft-like exploration. And you can, you can take liberties that, um, liberties of like learning and just kind of exploring and having fun with the process of diving within workflows that exist and are um, set and kind of growing within that. Um, it's a great place to do that kind of exploration. And freelance, I loved it because you have such a wide, diverse range of esports production. I think, I think we all know that like, you know, it's almost impossible to compare a Clash Royale esports production with a Valorant esports production. It's two wildly different workflows, two wildly different um, requirements to make that broadcast successful. So when you're freelance, you do have that ability to get exposure to all these different workflows, all these different environments, and you have, I would say, like an accelerated rate of like picking up all these different tricks and tools um, that you wouldn't necessarily have the ability to if you were um, full-time with a production company or let's say a Riot Games or a game company um, that had like a broadcast team. Um, so you said earlier that you're enjoying watching uh, R6 Pro League and stuff like that. Would you ever first, firstly how would you ever want to work on like an R6 event and how much bigger do you think it can get? And then secondly, how long do you think it's going to be until mainstream TV across the world is starting to broadcast eSports daily or even weekly compared to it just staying online via Twitch and YouTube, etc.? Um, do, you, do you mind if, I, if you could re-ask that middle question? Uh, so about the R6? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, do you think R6 is just going to keep on getting bigger or just because of how small of a game it is, and would you ever like to work on a R6 production? Um, so yeah, just to answer that one first, uh, I would love to work on a R6. I feel like I would want to work on like almost every production I watch, because um, I just, I just love getting the exposure to all these different people who are passionate about gaming and esports. Um, I would definitely be excited to do our uh, work within the uh, R6 broadcast just because I really love watching it. And I I like the energy the broadcast has. I like the pacing the broadcast has. So it's always, it's, it's something I'm definitely interested in and would love to do. Um, and for R6, I think one of the yeah one of one of the big things to always talk about when it comes to any esports broadcast is like how do how do we grow like how does that happen and i think that 
it's a difficult thing to answer as a production because you have control of your production and you can grow and uh, foster growth within your viewership with good production, but there's only so much that you can control in terms of people's interest in the game. Um, but I think cre creating a good broadcast that is um, resonant to the viewership and is relatable to the viewership as opposed to just broadcasting the content um, is one of the best ways to grow um, viewership and grow the eSport. Um, but yeah, as, as things go, if people don't like playing the game, it is a little, it, I would say it does face the challenge of having like a, um, a less popular stream. But the more, I think the more I've worked in eSports, the less I care really about the actual viewership numbers because I've seen like absolutely beautiful broadcasts that like I am jealous that I didn't work on it. And they have like a fraction of the, of the viewership of things that like I worked on and like I was super proud of, but it's just, it, it's just the nature of people's interests. And I think that by no means is the viewership number of a stream any indication about uh, the success or the um, the quality of the broadcast, especially when it comes to esports, because so much of it is just if you like a game, you'll watch it, and if you don't like a game, you don't watch it. Um, and then I guess for the second the second question, um, oh my gosh, what was the second question? Sorry for the long winded uh, second. No, worries, it's all good. Um, how long do you think it's going to take growth wise to the industry as a whole yeah. until it starts getting streamed? daily or even weekly on mainstream TV across the world instead of just staying online with Twitch and YouTube, etc. Totally. Um, it's, I think this is a question that's like people have always wondered, you know, what's going to happen? And I think a lot of people have taken chances and tried to make um, esports broadcasts on national television or um, weekly shows or things like that. Um, and I think that it does work to a certain degree, but I feel like so much of the world is moving away from national television or, you know, these scheduled broadcasts and stuff um, that I think if I, if I had to give my take of what esports is, is esports will live on the internet and eventually I, I just see it as like internet TV and whether it's stre streamed on YouTube, Twitch, or whatever other platform it will be on. But I don't see um, the demographic that uh, is into esports and into gaming um, signing up for like a, tele a television um, package. Um, I see it just trending uh, more so just being on the internet and just because everyone has the internet at this point. Any more questions, folks? Um, when you've done one job for quite a few years and you get like uh, at a high level at it, do you have any tips on not getting complacent and lazy in that position? Yeah, yeah, I got a couple of tips. Um, I think one of the um, one of the most important things to remember when you've done a role or a position within the gallery or control room or a production, when you've done it so for so long, you get so good that you know you've almost become numb to the process where you're like, okay, it's just another day. Like, let's do this, 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 and the, wow, the broadcast is done already. Um, but I think finding fun in all of the moments that uh, arise throughout production and just taking those as like a nice uh, treat for yourself. And I would say one of the things that have helped me is, you know, just try, uh, always remind yourself that the, no matter how many times 
or how how good you are at doing something it'll it'll feel like you know it's a process that you are so comfortable with and it doesn't feel fresh or when it whatever but the stories that happen on the broadcast are always going to be new it's always going to be um something that you can dig into and pull energy from and i think that that's one of the best ways to keep it fresh is just acknowledging that this, there's so many storylines that are happening within this and so many moments so many little tiny moments where like you know you'll see a player flustered or you'll see a player excited or whatever and taking that and using that as fuel to kind of drive your excitement forward as um you kind of go through production um <clears throat> you've mentioned passion a lot uh is that the main thing that drives you when the days are getting sort of long or you're walking uh, you're working multiple events in a row and you're feeling a bit burnt out or down or whatever is that is it passion that makes you get back up and get in those like moments of energy or are there things outside of working or you know finding energy within esports that you do to sort of counterbalance yeah um i think um a really good thing is when it's it's a lot of things really also a really good question um it's it's really important to create balance um so i just to give context of why well, i'm going to go on a, like a tiny little spiel here um so I used to play League of Legends professionally, and then I went straight from playing professionally, like scrims every day, 12 hours, to go into broadcast for, you know, broadcast lasts about 12 hours those days. Um, and there's a lot of burnout because, you know, especially if you're working on like a certain project and it's just like, you know, in my case it was a bunch of League of Legends, is don't feel like since you're broadcasting, a certain game or broadcasting a certain esport that you need to play it or you need to be like super in tune with it and i think it's one of the best things you can do your do for yourself is um create boundaries when you start to feel that sense of like saturation um just so that you can always kind of come at things with fresher eyes um because it, it helps you get a better perspective of what you're doing, what um, and how you're making uh, the viewership feel by you know choices on the broadcast, and just it just gives you a better perspective of things. Um, so definitely with that. But in terms of like when you're in the moment and you're like, oh my gosh, we're on the eighth hour, um, and we just had lunch, and I'm stuffed, I'm falling asleep. I think it's it's always good to remind yourself that um, as much as the process is like, because you almost have to become sort of numb to the process to execute constantly of like you know a high pressure environment um, in live broadcast, but um, I totally forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, I w but yeah, I would say um, just remember, oh yeah, so this is what I was going to say. So I would say um, the viewership and just just understanding that the viewership hasn't been there for the eight hours, or sometimes they have, and they're just as ex they're probably just as excited as they were when they first started watching. And just understanding that the viewership, um, and the p the players watching love this game. They love they love watching it, and they're they're there for all the fun. They're there for all the memes. They're there for all the the failures or whatever, and they love it no matter what. And I think just understanding that, like, even though you're so in the process and it's just a grind, that on the other side of that, there's people who are having a really good time whether it's memeing in Twitch chat or just joking around with friends on Discord about what's happening or being like, oh my gosh, this play was sick. And just remembering that you're servicing like that passion and that love. Thank you, that was really useful, thank you. Hi, definitely a confetti student here. 
<laughs> so um, you mentioned how you start off as a, a player and then you moved into observing and then eventually uh, you dabbled in, or you, you were a technical director and director for Riot Games. My question is, getting the moving from an observer to the TD and the directing role, is that something that Riot asked you or is that something that you actively put, your, you know, put yourself out for? And if you were the one who put yourself out for, how do you look for these opportunities? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, definitely a student of Confetti. Um, so um, it, I think it went a little bit of both ways. Uh, I think Riot was a very uh, early adopter of uh, taking, taking people who played games and putting them in positions in live broadcast because they understood the game at such a uh, fundamental level where like they saw the storylines, they saw um, what the players cared about. Um, and to be, not to say that like you, not to say that people who don't have backgrounds in gaming can't identify those things, but it, what Riot Games saw is that they can take uh, players, they can take gamers who understood the game at that level and train them up through uh, a full comprehensive experience of what uh, esports broadcast is and give them a very uh, holistic um, foundation to uh, putting on an esports broadcast. Uh, so it went a little bit of both ways. Um, a lot of like Riot identifying like, oh, this is like a, a path that we can kind of, s a trajectory that we can send people on and it'll be beneficial to everyone. Um, and yeah, I think that that was, that was um, definitely a, a really cool experience and it's definitely one where you have to, you don't uh, end up, you know, directing or technical directing uh, from observing if you don't want to. Uh, they definitely weren't forcefully making me do it. Um, so it was definitely one of the, uh, a little bit of both and uh, just showing that, you know, uh, initiative and just wanting to um, be a part of it and as as things go it's um, yeah that's pretty much it <laughs> I didn't want to ramble anymore cool uh, I've got a question um, so upscaling from one role obviously observing is important but in terms of um, your responsibility for the whole broadcast going from observing to TD is quite a big jump um, when you're already working jobs in the industry, how do you find the time or how do you recommend people find the time for learning new skills? Yeah, um, to, to find time, you just have to make time. Um, from, just so speaking from personal experience, um, when I went from observing to TDing, um, I would go, uh, so at the time it was, I was uh, observing um, EU, it was EU Challenger, that's what they were calling it at the time. Um, so yeah, it was like the EU Challenger series, um, or Academy, I believe it might have been called. Um, so I would be there on my, uh, on I, I would be observing that day, and then since it was, uh, the time zones were definitely different for the United States, I would, everybody would leave and then I would stay after and uh, mess around on the production switcher with the permission, of course. I wouldn't, you know, I would never, I would never sneak into the control room. Um, but yeah, I think just uh, making time and just, just under, I, I went in with understanding that like, I'm not getting paid for this, but I think it is uh, a great opportunity to learn, um, and it's a very valuable experience, not even just to be eventually become a TD, but just to understand how my role is incorporated in that. And I think that that's, um, just to kind of just go away from this question for a little bit, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, just, just to say, just because you are interested in being a TD or a director or a tape op or a tape producer or whatever, it doesn't mean that you only do that. I would strongly encourage everyone to try everything or at least ask someone who does it what they do and how they do it and how it involves all the other pieces of the puzzle. 
because when you understand what everyone else does, it helps you do a better job uh, with what you do. So, and this goes like in every single direction and like feel like spread out and experiment as much as you can with as many roles as possible. But yeah, going back to your question, definitely just make the time. And it's one of those things where I definitely missed out on you know weekends or free time to play games. As much as I love playing games and um, spending all day uh, from when I wake up to going to sleep playing games, um, just understanding that that time is like um, an opportunity to learn to grow and to experience something that you might not have the chance to. And just taking that and just using it, using that time wisely. Um, are there any changes from a broadcast perspective um, on esports that you would like to see? Um, what was the? Uh, are there any um, from a broadcast perspective oh. on esports? Are there any changes that you'd like to see in the industry? Um. I think uh I think not to like I think there are changes I would like to see um but it it requires so many changes to happen that would just be like so cascading and I think um from my understanding like I'm sure there's like plenty of things that would uh like the domino effect would start and it would just be like things would come up that I didn't even have the foresight to imagine uh, or foresight to see um, something that could happen. Um, but I I think um, something that I, I do, I'm, I'm afraid of is that, you know, currently right now we have, you know, a big, uh, a bit a, like a large amount of esports broadcasts being done, and I think just um, it's almost like a blank, blanket statement of like you know esports broadcast or esports live production, and I think go like I would love to see going forward that each game each esports is done the appropriate amount of uh, justice uh, for like what it is uniquely because these, the games, the viewership, the audience, they're all so different. And I think to just uh, for esports production, it's you need to do so much customizing and so much catering to these specific groups and the specific viewership to really um, resonate with what the players actually care about. Um, that I think that it's it's a, that's something that I, I wouldn't necessarily like to see change, but it's something that I would like to see always being reminded of with as as um, esports is continuing to grow crazily. Um, it's just a good reminder that you know there is no formula for esports uh, broadcast. It's it is what the game dictates. I think we've got time for one last question. Um, it's a bit more of a personal question. I don't know how you want to answer it, but um, you mentioned before, mentioned before that um, you made the move from playing league professionally to production. Um, how did you make that switch? And was it due to you coming to a point saying, oh, I need to make a feasible living rather playing or rather in doing production than playing? Is there a sort of like a moment you said, I need to change or? Yeah, um, it, it was definitely uh, to go through like the timeline. It's definitely wasn't one day I was playing and then the next day I was let. It was definitely a process in, um, uh, at the time I was a, you know, I'll kind of go, I guess, chronologically. It's pretty much I was playing professionally and then as you do when you uh, start to notice that, you know, maybe I'm not like the best player in the world. 
I know we all think we are the best player in the world, um, but I wasn't the best player in the world. And I think that it was a moment where I was like, I do care a lot about esports and I care about um, gaming. And I wanted to um, head into a direction that I thought was a good combination of you know my passions, what it, like whether it being like cinema, film, video, uh, and then esports. Um, so it was a natural progression to um, move into um, what was the next step was broadcast observing. Um, so it, it was definitely a, a moment of transitioning gracefully um, from player. So what I did was I was a player, and then I moved on to a coaching position or analyst position. At the time, team budgets weren't necessarily massive. Um, so I was doing a little bit of both. Um, so I was a coach and analyst. And then I moved on to um, doing some hosting as well, because naturally when you know, you're know you a coach and analyst, you can talk a lot uh, and you can ramble. So now you can turn that into a hosting position. So I was hosting for a bit. And then I was extremely lucky. And I think that to get work work at uh, work in a position that you love and work in a dream job for a lot of people you have to get lucky so I got lucky and I knew someone who knew someone and you know how it goes with networking and stuff which is like an extremely important thing to do so I knew someone who knew someone and there was a open position for an observer um, because um, one of my uh, the you know eventual, Team, team lead, he was feeling under the weather, so they needed an observer right away. And I was like, I can, I can observe, I can do that. And then they were like, are you sure? And I was, then, you know, went through the whole interview process and all that. But yeah, just um, a slow transition and just networking and, um, and creating opportunities to be able to be lucky. Uh, just to clarify, how long like would you say the time period was between being a player and then settling in at Riot or in that observing position? Yeah, um, probably about a. Y if I had to give a time range, Roughly. it was it would, it would probably be like a year and a half to two and a half years. So, and that was just like of transitioning between and just feeling out like you know what works best for me. Thank you. Thank you, JD, for answering uh, all of these really good questions, to be honest. They were really, really good questions. But thank you so much for answering them so eloquently. Let's show some love real quick. Thank you. So, folks, we're going to take a short transition break uh, so that we can move into the studio. If you just want to remain in here for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, and we will continue in a few moments. Thank you.
Okay, let's get down. This light.
Welcome to the Snoop Cam. This ain't Snoop, this is Jin Rai, head of esports. Okay, um, yeah, you're backstage, you're backstage, you are in the control room slash the production gallery. And what you're gonna be seeing is effectively uh, the, uh, your peers, your students working alongside uh, our guests today. So the briefing, the engagement, working with all the tech and all the gear throughout. So you get a taster for what it's like uh, working on uh, a big scale production or any scale production. I'm going to hand over to our guests to take it away. Hello. Um, do we have um, do we have any kind of stand or whatever? Um, just yeah. so that I that the the nature of oh who's who's switching this? Oh look at you! Great job. <laughs> but will you catch me on the other cam? <laughs> okay, we can go back here. <laughs> Thank you. I know all the things that are um, really annoying for someone who's cutting the show. Speaking from experience, let me just change my single real quick. <laughs> cool. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, bear with me. I'm new here. Um, so, what we'll be doing is a mock run through of a show. We do have um, a rundown. Oh. Yeah, so we do have a, a rundown of, I believe it's a EU LCS um, show. Lovely, thank you. Um, and then I can give you all a preview. Oh my gosh. Well, I can't give you a preview. Um, but pretty much we'll be going through, um, let's see how they block this out in EU. Sorry, I'm a NA. Um, League of Legends are um, cool. So yeah, it looks like we'll be going through pretty much the A block leading into commercial break. Um, throughout this, I'll be kind of calling um, the show and also giving commentary um, of like what would be happening just because for the sake of giving like a good demo and getting a good feel for like how the pace is gonna be on everything, um, I will be using my imagination and I'll ask all of you to use your imagination. Um, so, um, let's see if I can um, get this mic good. In the meantime, so just what I handed out, that's um, a real EULCS rundown. So we're gonna work off of, I believe, just a block, just as an example, just so you can see how um, the workflow would look like. So, you know, we're going from A1, A2, etc. But we'll let um, JD decide how that works, so. Yeah, so I think what we'll do is we'll be going through the A block and then we'll just have a quick little retro and then we'll kind of keep pushing forward and we'll just kind of feel it out all together. And if we have any questions or any kind of things that we want to talk about, we'll stop down and we'll just kind of go through it. It won't be like an exact one for one show flow kind of thing, but we'll just go through like the paces of it and like what kind of communication would happen um, during the show. Um, so pretty much leading into every show, there would probably be a bunch of tech issues that we'd be panicking over. Um, and then we would just pretend everything's fine. But since everything's fine already, um, we won't need to pretend um, anything. So um, I guess just to start things off, we would start off with um, some sort of countdown clock. So I guess if we want, we can start filling out some of these positions before we uh, um, hop into it. So I guess I need um, some uh, butts and seats. If um, y'all would like to entertain me on that. So feel free to sit wherever you want. Um, J Jacob, do you have any uh, recommendations of who, who sits where? I think that that might be um, where the RBT is. Um, I'll also, so this is like a fun kind of creative thing is since our VT is the first frame is starts with black, um, since we don't have black on the production switcher, um, at least w from what I can see, um, we'll just use that first frame of black as our fake black. Yeah. 
and then pretty much um before you know every show the way the way that the it kind of all plays out in terms of preparing and getting ready for the show um does everybody have a rundown in here okay we can we can we can share it and then i can put this one over here and then we can all um at least everyone in the control room will know what's kind of going to happen um oh it's different pages Oh, yeah, yeah, but it's kind of the same. Kind of. It's okay. I'll I'll use uh, I'll use um verbal verbal communication. This will be a uh, not necessarily 100% all the way through following it, but we'll it's a loose guide. Um but pretty much the way, you know, the start of these production days, everybody kind of uh, the producer will kind of wrap up and say when the rundown is pretty much complete on how the uh, kind of working off of the base show skeleton, they'll fill it out with the content of the day after you know the previous day's story meeting or the story meetings leading up to it. They'll kind of fill out that content within the skeleton of the show um, rundown, um, and then pretty much at the top of the day, once the producer is like totally cool with how the show flows and how it feels in the rundown and it's all timed out, um, the producer will usually let people know that the rundown's ready and uh, pretty much the whole production crew will kind of run through things on their own as they're kind of doing their um, tech checks and uh, ESU at the top of the day. Um, and I'm sure all of you are aware of that, but just saying, you know, just for, just for the sake. Um, so I guess with that being said, we can kind of get into it. I'll talk us through it and it won't be any kind of pressure or whatever to do things exactly uh, as if it was a live show, but we'll just kind of talk through it and I would be going through, I guess, the communication that would be happening in the control room. And I'll put on a couple of different hats as I talk through this, um, just so um, we can all um, imagine. I, I, might, I might not use the uh, different voices, but if you can just bear with me on my uh, the different personalities that I'll pull out for the different roles. Um, cool, so um, usually uh, leading into the show, you would, we would just kind of have like a blank slate up or some sort of, uh, we would usually not put black um, on on program, but we would have, is it cool if I start hitting the production switcher now? Yeah. <laughs> cool, I just don't wanna, I just don't wanna ruin anything. Perfect, so um, at this point in time, um, I, let's see what we have on graphics. Um, if you could, um, let's, let's actually call up the, um, We'll call it that roster. It should be the CLG roster graphic. You can pull that up. Perfect. Um, so kind of like leading into the show, we can just imagine that this right here is um, actually here. Let's, um, I'll bring in my camera so you all can see me. Um, so we'll just imagine this full screen um, right there is just um, going to be a logo with some sort of thing, just so that it's um, broadcast friendly and broadcast safe. So as the leading moments into the actual countdown clock that goes up on air, we're all safe and protected. So this would be like a logo of like the show or something, something nice and safe. Um, so, but before we would get into it, um, we would, uh, we can call up actually the countdown now. Cool, and then we would have our nice little countdown up um, over here. And I believe, since it is on, I'm gonna undercut. Is this on? Am I doing this right? <laughs> um, how do I, uh, is, can you show me the, the way the DSKs are kind of? Yeah, sure, uh, it should be to this right here, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm still stuck on this. Yeah. So if I were to, okay, okay, cool. So I tie it? What? Oh, it's, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so for example, if we were doing a countdown clock and we had some sort of VT rolling in the background, it would just be something like that, or we would just have the countdown leading into it. Um, pretty much during this countdown time, we would be, um, pretty much everybody would be in show position, depending on the countdown length, of course, sometimes an hour, sometimes, people will kind of be coming back from break, you know, 30 minutes into the countdown or whatever. But for the sake of it, we're 15 minutes in, everybody would definitely be in their seats and hopefully not missing. Um, and we would be kind of preparing for getting into show. 
Uh, we would all be doing our final adjustments in terms of lighting, um, and we would be up on air at this point in time. So we can just, for the sake of kind of moving forward and not waiting the full 14 minutes, we will be, <laughs> we'll be um, going to our open. So from there, we will be going to, um, so I would do um, pretty much a standby to roll VT. And I'll do a fake count here. We'll go to zero. So in five, four, three, two, one, and roll VT. Cool. And then there would be like some cool hype music here, of course. And um, I'm sure we would all feel like really uh, excited to <laughs> um, go into the, our top of show. 10 seconds. Cool. So then this is, uh, at this point in time, we would have um, either tape producer or we would see um, some diagnostics for uh, our, our VT that would give us some sort of indication of when the playlist is ending or when the, the VT is ending. So we would have, you know, tape producer or uh, assistant director in some cases. They would be going five, four, three, two, one, and up on our talent, cue talent. And then at this point in time, producer would be um, saying, hey, um, talent and they would also be going along with that assistant director call. They would say five, four, three, two, Stand one. Stand by two, talent and, and you're on. Cool. And then at this point in time, we would say um, standby for our names and let's bring in the names. Which one is that? Is that this one? Is that this one? Cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> cool. And bring in names. Perfect. And then at this, uh, and that has a cool animation on it, correct? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you can take it out and perfect and animate names. Lovely. That's what. There we go. That's us. Cool. And then we would probably have uh, um, leading into it. We would do um, coming usually out of the T's. There would be either um, pad on that opening uh, T's where there would be music attached to that video. Um, that we would track all the way through to the open and then we would fade out that music. So the call for that would be um, standby um, to wipe to or standby to dissolve to uh, press cam and dissolve, animate names and fade out the music. Um, cool, so at this point in time, we would uh, standby to lose the names and lose the names, perfect. Um, so from here, we would be Quick on camera, we would say our hellos, welcome to the studio, yada yada. We have an exciting day ahead of us. Um, and then you have a standings full screen, correct? Uh, we can use the we can use the pow power that one. Yeah. Sure. Okay, cool. And stand by for our standings full screen. And is there is there a cool animation on the top of it? Okay, cool. So in that case, um, pretty much leading into the show, uh, we we would pretty much go through all the different assets of what's a good in and what's a uh, if anything has a good in or if things need to be pre-revealed and then we'll wipe to it or uh, transition to it. So in this case, this full screen that we have up, uh, you can pre uh, you can preload the the full screen right now. So this uh, the we do have a full screen, but the um, animation at the top of it, let's say it's, an, it's not a good animation or there is no animation, we would pre-reveal it, um, and then we would do our transition to it. So and we'd say, anime. Um, stand by music, stand by full screen, in three, two, one, and dissolve. Um, cool, then music would be playing, ba 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 ba, and then it would be a uh, voiceover um, talking about the standings. Wow, I can't believe all the teams look the way they do. Um, amazing. Cool, and then we would say standby back on camera. Um, in some cases, it would be um, coming back on camera. Sometimes you go just full screens back to back, and then you would just do a hot change from there. There you go. <laughs> um, cool, so in this case, like let's say we are, uh, so standby to come back on camera, standby to, um, stand to lose the music in three, two, one, lose the music and dissolve. Cool. And then at this point in time, we can, pre we can start loading up our next graphic at this point. In, uh, and then at this block, uh, or uh, sorry, on this slug, we'll just be kind of talking news and going through some B-roll. So um, if you could just uh, 
rack that to like the middle of the video and we don't need to necessarily, yeah, we'll just have like some nice kind of graphic there. So we would say um, uh, for this for the slug specifically after the standings, we would be doing um, just a run, kind of just going through some talking points and news points of like, you know, it, any kind of like, you know, roster swap, whatever, or even stuff from the day before. So um, what we would do is, if this would just be B-roll that's living in the background, so um, the call for that would just be um, standby uh, VT, um, uh, standby for some B-roll in VT, standby VT, and roll VT, resolve. And then the at caster's talent, they would be talking, you know, I can't believe this team is designing it and producing it and crewing it. Um, isn't it absolutely amazing what this team is doing? And then as the VT is kind of rolling, uh, coming to a close, or the B-roll is coming to a close, or they're finishing up their points, you would just take the cue um, either through the talent or through the end of the B-roll, and then you would just come out of it. So in this case, end of the B-roll, talent's still kind of talking about it. We can just come back on camera. So stand by to come back on camera. At this point in time, the producer can give a cue to talent. Sometimes talent is already aware that you know the B-roll is coming up so that they'll al also be just um, cognizant that they will probably be back on camera at this point in time. So based on you know different control rooms, they all kind of operate a little bit differently. Sometimes um, the producer will be giving cues every single time um, when the talent's back on camera. Sometimes it's just a well-oiled machine. The talent knows for the, these points, there's gonna be a B-roll. They'll be back on camera at the end of the B-roll. So they'll just kind of always be uh, working on camera. So it would be, oh, uh, here comes the, at the end of the B-roll, talent's still talking about, stand by to come back on camera in three, two, one, lose the music, um, and dissolve, of course. Um, so pretty much after that news, we'll be moving to our schedule full screen. And then most of the time, this will be uh, a cue from mostly the talent or the prompter scrolling to give the talent the cue on this. Um, so pretty much at this point in time, uh, what I'm listening for is um, as you are directing and um, TDing, you start to pick up like the pacing of how um, talent kind of delivers their sentences and when they are about to toss, they'll always I think everybody, all talent always has like a tell of when they're changing subject or there's a pause or there's a break or there's a moment or there's like a, they have a, you, sometimes they just have a word that they naturally say um, when they are kind of shifting subjects or moving on to the next point. So the talent will say, wow, that's a lot of news. Uh, I can't believe, um, I can't believe uh, all of those things happened. Um, Let's take a look at the schedule and stand by to dissolve to our graphics. Let's say that this is another graphic that doesn't have a great animation in, and then we'll have that pre-revealed. Great job, way to do it. Um, stand by graphics, stand by music. In three, two, one, dissolve music. And then music, ba 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 ba. I don't know what the song is. Hopefully we don't get um, DMCA'd. Um, Cool, so then they would be on the schedule, they'd be working through the schedule, and one of the easiest parts um, about a schedule is that you know when they're on their last talking point on the schedule because they'll be hitting the last match. And then you're like, okay, that's when I should probably get off of this thing. Um, so they'll be talking through the schedule, they're running through it, they'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, um, um, I don't know how to pronounce that last person's name, but they're, I can't believe that's the final match. And Stand by to come back on camera, stand by to lose music. In three, two, one, dissolve, lose music. Um, so here we are back on camera. Um, and then kind of just going through this some more. Um, the, way thing, the way things are kind of slugged out, and when I say slugged out, the way things are kind of laid out um, in rundowns, it varies, I would say very wildly um, from production to production. Sometimes uh, producers will want to slug out all of the talking points, sometimes producers will only want to slug out certain sections or graphics or whatever, or uh, different moves or transitions. So um, as, as you kind of go through a production, you'll see um, 
what is um, kind of filled out through there based off of any scripts that are filled into each of these production slugs. So it's always good to, when you are looking at the rundown, um, then here's a um, nice little reference. So when you're kind of like looking through the rundown, um, there we go, oh my gosh, my right or my left? Um, <laughs> oh, it's, uh, thank you. So yeah, when you're, um, Yeah, and so when you're when you're looking through a rundown, usually you'll be kind of you'll either have like a printed out one or whatever. Um, there is like you know it'll always vary if there's a script associated with a slug or if it's just a slug that's trying to tell you about the pacing of a segment. Um, and then cool, thank you. Yeah, so so in this case, for example, um, just based off of looking at what's um, what's already kind of filled out. The schedule will, they'll come back on camera. They'll do, there's a certain slug, uh, the name of the slug, or the, the text within the slug is a pre-match analysis for vitality. Or that's what I'm assuming is VIT. I can only assume what a, a team's tri-code is. Um, but, so th it's a pre-match analysis for vitality. And I imagine uh, you can see in a couple of the columns uh, for EVS slash graphics, there is a graphic full screen for splice. Um, and apparently someone made the note here of them getting stomped. Um, so, um, so stand by for our full screen of anything you find appropriate for, uh, um, of Splice getting stomped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is there a fun animation on that one? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we can, um, we can actually, so let's, uh, clear, um, our graphics channel. Perfect. Cool. So at this point in time, that that's it, right? Cool. Yeah, and then, uh, cool, stand by to animate our full screen for Splice getting stomped and animate full screen. Music. And this is totally Splice um, getting stomped and not the roster of TSM in like 2016 or 2015. Um, sweet, so we would be at this point in time um, the talent would be kind of running through this and based off of like previous rehearsal or how they feel the pacing would be, they would be kind of going through the talking points here. And then um, based off of like, you know, previously going through rehearsal or what the talking points the talent would want to run through, um, they would have like, you know, a designated point where they're pretty much done with the full screen. So we would say, um, stand by to come back on camera, stand by to lose the graphics, stand by to lose music in three, two, one, lose it. Cool. Um, so moving forward here, uh, after that pre-match analysis of definitely uh, Vitality and the full screen of Splice, we'll be tossing it to our caster desk. So from here, I'll pretend like I am, in this case, what talent was on the analyst desk? It was Shox and Officio. So, um, so I'll pretend like I'm Shox. Um, and then I'll be tossing over to um, Pyra and Crepo for the caster desk. Cool. So. Um, in this case, um, <laughs> this might be a weird repeat, but just bear with me. Um, actually, just for this this point in time, we'll um, we'll uh, dissolve. Is it this one? Oh no, it's this one, right? Cool. We'll just dissolve that off. Thanks. Um, cool. Uh, so at this point in time, I'll, we'll be doing our toss to um, our casters, and then I for the communication that kind of happens in the control room leading up to this moment, pretty much on that last talking point, pretty much that full screen, we would say, you know, standby casters, the producer would be on heads with the casters, and say standby casters coming to you after this, uh, these kind of final points here. Casters would probably give a thumbs up or they'd be panicking, drinking their last bit, little bit of uh, water or whatever. Um, and then uh, a good common practice is just previewing it and just making sure that the caster is indeed there um, before you go to the camera. Um, so uh, the call is kind of leading up to it is the producer, as I kind of give my counts uh, and wipe to the camera or transition to the caster camera, the producer will give the heads up, coming to you in three, two, one. Or they'll also be going off of, in some cases, some workflows, the casters and the um, analysts or the different talents, they'll all be 
uh, able to hear each other um, uh, post, uh, post fade, so they can all talk to each other if they are being tracked on program. And then the casters, of course, will be able to hear um, the uh, analysts toss over to them so they can do the appropriate timing and all that. Some uh, productions don't necessarily have that convenience, so you might need to rely on doing counts uh, and having like very clear and tight communication between the producer or the uh, TD director, um, any of the combinations to the talent to cue them when that toss does come through. But I believe most workflows, they can talent should be able to hear each other. Um, I know that on a lot of remote ones, it's uh, like Discord, and then the talent will mute their mics, and they'll all be in the same Discord channel, and they'll be able to converse that way. Um, so pretty much leading up to this, analysts will say. Well, that'll do us for uh, that'll do it for us on the analyst desk. Um, it looks like we will be handing it over to um, me again and someone else for the call on the game. Uh, and then at that point in time, I know that this is all a span of a moment, um, but just to describe all the moving pieces, um, as that kind of toss comes through, the TD director will say, "Stand by for our caster camera." Um, and what what I'll do, um, pers what I like to do personally is I like to give a count, even though it isn't a true count, um, a true second count. It gives people like time to adjust, and um, it gives people visibility of what's happening. Um, so even though I give like a, I'll say standby for casters and three, two. Even though that three, two, one count isn't necessarily a true second. It'll give people um, anticipation and time to time out all of their adjustments that they need to do when we do go from one camera to another. And it's always good to do, um, and then we can just start a little wide on the camera and then we can do a nice little push in and then we'll, um, oh, okay. <laughs> Sound share. Uh, um, <laughs> okay, cool. We'll just pretend like I'm not seeing a nice lower third uh, on the multi-beer. Um, okay, cool. So, um, so we'll start a little wider, perfect framing, and then uh, I'll give a cue and for a slight push in, and then we can do a nice settle in shot. Um, sweet. And then I guess let's stand by for our uh, talent lower third, mm -hmm. and then we can actually uh, you can clear that channel as well. Lovely. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, Stand by for our lower third, stand by for our talent. Cool. And here comes the toss. Oh my gosh. And we're going to hand it over to the caster. Is, uh, um, take it away. In uh, three, two, start your move. And dissolve. Perfect. Uh, and animate names. Lovely. And we can stop. <laughs> and then we would land on whatever framing you know is appropriate for the casters. And then we would do a push and settle. Um, and then depending on the production, if there is like a, let's say there is a mini jib or a, a any of those kind of things, we would do pretty much we would land and then we would kind of settle into a float after the lower third clears. So it's time to lose the names and lose the names. And then I think just a common practice for me, I know some, some all directors and all TDs, they're always kind of different with how they call things. I'd like to give a standby and I'd like to, um, uh, just I, because I, I come from a very kind of operator um, background, so I understand that, or I really like the importance of giving people like as much heads up of what's going to happen. So um, usually leading into each animation, I'll also say stand by to lose and lose, or some sort of communication like that. I think one of the most important things is when you're kind of giving these communications um, of what's going to happen is that. You are you, you, um, you're consistent with what you say. So when you say um, "stand by," it's always it, when when you want someone to animate something, or if you want someone to pre-reveal something, you'll always use the same words because what ends up happening is operators will always be listening for that specific word. So the more consistent and the more uh, exact you can be with what you say and give as much heads up. Uh, the better and smoother things will kind of go throughout the process. Um, so pretty much uh, now jumping back to uh, the actual broadcast that's happening, um, we would do, uh, we would be landing at our talent, we would do our talent lower thirds, and then um, league specifically, they're, they're pretty quick paced with how they kind of go from straight to the casters to team lineups. I know that um, 
sometimes the format of these blocks kind of change and stuff, but but be ready sometimes. Uh, you could go from a lower third and then right from that lower third names on the talent, you, they'll be tossing straight to a uh, team lineup. So if you want, we can stand by for our team lineup for, let's do the CLG one. I like that one, it's fun. Um, cool, so stand by for our CLG lineup. Um, stand by music in three, two, one, animate. Lovely, and then there'd be music playing and then talent, uh, the casters, they'll be talking. Here's Happy Bin. Uh, Happy Bin will be in the top lane, and we have Trash Can in the jungle, um, and then we have uh, Bin Bag in mid lane, and then Wheelie Bin uh, for our marksman, um, and then Bin, just Bin, for our support. And then stand by to lose the full screen, stand by to lose music in three, two, one, lose it. Cool. So going from there, we'll be heading into our champion select and in game. We can just pretend like that one. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, there's a background on that, or yeah, yes. okay, cool, um, cool. And then uh, actually, could you animate it? This is so so. Bear with me here. We're just, and you can just bring it in. Cool. Um, so for this, we'll actually do something a little bit fun. So we'll actually head over. We'll go back onto this camera over here, and then um, for for cool um, graphics, kind of like this. Uh, do you think you can point that camera just like at the? Um, Maybe let's um, let's kind of point it onto the brick, if that doesn't mess up uh, with any cabling or whatever. And then if you can zoom into the wall to kind of create a very like ambiguous background, something nice and abstract that's uh, fun for everyone to look at. Cool. Um, so we can actually lose that graphic. Yeah, that's great. Um, so this is like one of the ones you know it's always you know art for art's sake. I think that that's one of the most important things is if you can do something fun where it's like, um, and this is like a kind of cool creative choice. So as you um, one of the fun things, you know, as if when you, you get the opportunity to, to direct or TD is like you can kind of have like you can have these moments where you can let's let's say um, we'll just go into this and then I'll, I'll kind of talk through it. So um, cool. Stand by for our full screen. Um, what was the. Oh, yeah. So this will be stand by stand by for our like full screen or whatever leading into game um, in three, two, one, dissolve music and animate. Oh, you can animate the the, um, oh, you the want group this one? thing. Sorry, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then you can animate it. Perfect. So then at this, Imagine that one time. yeah. So then <laughs> then this would yeah, then this would be on top or whatever, and we would um we'd be like okay, so they're just kind of talking through all these things, and then um. Cool. Stand by for uh, champion select. So leading into champion select, um, and then just just for when you kind of do these kind of shots where you're doing a live graphic over a live camera, um, what you can what you can do is you don't necessarily need to try to time it perfectly. You can just kind of use your transition module and uh, go for it like that. So um, is when you do DSK uh, when you do DSK two tie is that pretty much working on your transition module? Yeah, but uh, or what would it oh, what's uh, DSK two one is the graphic one, right? DSK one is the graphic one. Okay. So if I do if I go tie and then I go like that, bear with me. <laughs> Um, so uh, when I go like that, okay, cool, sweet. Um, so yeah, we you can just you can use your transition module to kind of go off of that graphic clean to whatever camera is next. So um, pretty much uh, for different games, there's like a moment for for different esports. There's there's a moment in time where you need all of production to pretty much be aligned on what um, is the start of game. I think that this is probably one of the moments uh, in productions where there could be hiccups when live ops or tournament ops they're um, they're not necessarily aligned with production, and then early send-ins happen, and then because like uh, we work in we work within a world where our the esports broadcasts are being driven by a game state that usually is timed. Um, and on a timer. So um, at this point in time, as we're kind of leading in, casters are vamping. We're kind of bouncing between our different cameras uh, of what's happening on stage or you know, the different uh, player point of views or uh, all that just to kind of you know, uh, tell the story and bounce between the different teams, uh, go between players of, that you know, the talent have talking points on. Um, 
and then um, as we kind of lead into this eventual champion select that's going to happen, we are definitely, um, it, as you know, League of Legends champion selects, there is a timer, and m missing the first bans aren't, it's not the end of the world, missing first bans or, you know, a first couple of things, but it is nice to see it happen. Um, so getting aligned on when the start of the game happens and then going into it and knowing that it's a proper start to the match is super important. So um, at this point in time, the director and the producer will both be communicating to different parties in most cases. Sometimes it's going to be one person talking to everybody. Um, but just for the sake of it, the director will call and say, um, stand by for champion select everyone, which is a cue to multiple parties, whether it's um, some workflows will pre-record things or whatever or um, run through a couple of things. Um, but one of the main things is getting your graphics ready with a champion select overlay or something like that. So then we can just pretend like this um, this one, yeah, that lower third one. That's lovely. That's a great champion select overlay. <laughs> um, cool, so you can actually, um, you can pre-reveal that one so you can animate it right now. Perfect, so we would just say standby for champion select, sta standby to send them in. Um, so the producer would say, would be in, in talks or the director would be in talks with tournament ops, they would say, um, hey, tournament ops, this is broadcast. Um, we are good to send them in. And then the pretty much once that queue kind of comes out, everybody will be on high alert and we'll all be staring at the game feed. And once you see the game feed, uh, go to the champion select mode or you know the ban map pick, whatever it is, uh, for whatever you know game it is, then you'll say standby to go to our um, our uh, champion select or whatever in three, two, one, and then we would go to it, we would key it on. Um, so over there, it was just um, just because sometimes it'll animate on, sometimes we have to pre-reveal it, or we'll have to go to some sort of ME composite. Um, but in just in this case, since we're pretending like this is a, a champion select lower third or whatever, or a map pick lower third, and it doesn't have like an animation in, for example, we would just kind of key that on um, with just the auto, um, auto dissolve. So we would go to the camera, we would dissolve it in, and then we would kind of be off to the races. Sometimes people will want to bring in music for um, a champion select, and then you would just do accordingly. Um, sometimes it's just um, the casters talking over what's happening. Um, so in this case, we would have music. So uh, just to kind of go back through that um, kind of motion, it'll be standby for champion select everyone. Uh, or the director or producer would be, hey, tournament ops, we are good for champion selects. Um, and then it would just go, um, and tournaments, we'll tournament ops are like, awesome, thank you, broadcast, we're totally going to send them in. We would all be excitingly staring at the game feed to see what's, what's our cue to go in. And then we would say, all right, cool, looks like we are in. Standby to go to a champion select, standby music in three, two, one, dissolve, and music. And then, it, you know, the classic champions like music, we go dun, 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 all that stuff. Um, and then as we kind of come to the close of ch uh, during champion selects, it's always important to, um, I think this is, this is actually a good kind of good moment to uh, talk about the, um, something that I, I don't see, um, I don't, I, I, sometimes I don't, I, I don't see it, um, in, uh, as you kind of see picks go through, it's good to always keep in mind the context of those picks. So sometimes you'll see, you know, I think a good example, just because we're already kind of talking about League of Legends, you'll see like a top laner pick, um, let's say like, uh, and I, ho I, hope, I hope you all can bear with me with me using League of Legends champions as an example. But say, let's say the top laner will pick a support champion like, um, Lulu or Braum or something. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know League of Legends, I'm sorry that I'm just saying words that don't mean anything to you. Um, so uh, that champion pick will kind of come through. I think what's most important to show that I like doing personally is not necessarily showing the top laner because the top laner doesn't tell you anything. The top laner is merely acting as um, 
someone to click a mouse, right? So they're not actually, that, that's not where the story is. So showing the top laner isn't necessarily the most important thing for that part in Champion Select. It would probably, in terms of priority of what you would want to show, is you would want to go to, you know, the support player of the team that's picking it, the support player of the enemy team, the AD carry of the team that's picking, the AD carry of the, the enemy team. And then also um, just trying to find the energy in the room. So if a coach is going crazy, you always go to the coach, things like that. But I think it's always good to remember the context of um, the picks that are happening and not necessarily the action of who's like clicking the mouse or whatever. I think that that's like an important thing to always remember within um, esports and gaming broadcasts is don't, um, don't necessarily follow the real life physical action follow the story in the virtual world because that's where all the storylines are. Um, cool, so just thank you for bearing with me on that little fun uh, uh, talk about Lulu and Braum. Um, cool, so then we would kind of be bouncing between these different cameras, going through the whole thing. At the end of champion select um, or map pick or whatever, there's always some sort of tell of like, it, this is the end. There's nothing more else to show, and we need to start getting ready for our gameplay. So at this point in time, we would say, um, cool, looks like that's the last character. All, all characters are locked or all champions are locked. Um, stand by for swaps or however your production is doing it. I know League of Legends, they do like a fun swap thing. You'll see the character swap for all the things. And then after that, they would be getting their last couple of shots. Um, and then we'd say stand by to lose champion select and stand by to lose music in three, two, one, lose champion select and lose music. And then we'd fade out the music. We'd kind of be doing our last second shots. And I think what's most important for the pacing for this point in the show is um, just going through, um, I think just building um, tension, building uh, the story and getting people ready for what's to come. And I think that it's just important to understand the pacing of that. So, you know, not settling on shots for too long where it feels um, maybe too much of like, a, like a, a little too slow paced. And you wanna kind of get people a little bit more ener energized kind of going into um, the start of game. So to get people hyped up, you wanna kind of follow that pacing and follow that energy so you know bouncing between the coaches back and forth back and forth you know not maybe not necessarily that fast but going between the coaches like you know talking about the player maybe you see a coach kind of like looking at the notes maybe you see a player like rubbing his hands or like picking at his fingers is in, like you always want to keep things like not gross or whatever if they're being gross then avoid it but if they're like you know any of kind of those like nervous anxious things you want to be trying to capture and just remember the pacing of it is uh, affecting the viewership. So as much as you can kind of do to kind of cater the shot sequence, the pacing, the timing of things to uh, make the viewers feel a certain way, it's like so important because it's a, it's the subtle things that add up over time. So all those things, uh, the pacing and all that, the more of that, those little nuanced things that you add to the broadcast, the better, um, the viewers will feel without necessarily being too um, aware of it. But those little things do add up and it does, um, it does add a lot in, uh, in the end. So we're kind of, you know, bouncing between our two different coach shots. Oh no, like this coach is like yelling at a player and then this coach is, has no emotion and then this player is just staring at the screen blankly, but still kind of trying to follow as much and show as much as you can building that anticipation for the game that is eventually about to happen. So coming out of that, um, that champion select will be heading into game. Oh my gosh, finally, this is pretty much what all the viewership is really trying to watch. Um, and I think that it's it's really important to be aware of that. I think that um, uh, to understand that uh, as much as like it is good and it, it's really important to care about, um, here, let's put on this. As much as it is to care about, uh, you know, doing a great analyst desk segment, doing a great pregame, I think what's when it comes down to it, people are trying to watch the match. People are trying to watch the game. So always being aware that, like, um, 
and always being aware and balancing that like and not being self-indulgent in the things that the viewership and putting uh egos aside and um that all that stuff aside and trying to service the game as much as you can so um that's why when i say you know the game is what people care about it's the game is what people care about and i think there's nothing wrong with uh, uh addressing that like there there is a large percentage of uh viewership that might have the stream all tabbed or whatever during the analyst desk segment i think uh people who watch esports they understand that like you know sometimes they just want to watch the game and that's that's totally fine so just being aware that like in the end it's always to service the game and having the game be the priority so not missing gameplay not going for any artsy fun cool stuff uh, at the sacrifice of gameplay is like rule number one in, in esports and gaming is gameplay comes first um so with that, with that being said, let's not be on a camera anymore and let's get to gameplay. Cool. So at this point in time, they're usually they're the after you know kind of the map pick, map ban, uh, champion select, whatever it is for you know the game that you're on. This kind of pre-game uh, moment of drafting or banning, um, there usually will be kind of like a succession of things that happen and follow that based off of. Um, the that ban happening or the draft happening and then pretty much in league of legends for example because since we uh have you know our tsm lineup and we conveniently have a league of legends client open uh as our spectator um will for what league of legends is is you'll see the uh, right after champion select you'll see the observers are loading in and then it's all one of the most important things of getting from uh, before game and into game is understanding what is the moment just before you hit gameplay and identifying that. Um, so for League of Legends, it's you know you'll see the um, you'll see the five you know characters or whatever on the top, five characters on the bottom, and you'll see them loading in with a percentage bar at the bottom. And it's um, super important to get the timing of everything and knowing like when you when it when gameplay will be accessible because um, the opening moments of gameplay and the missing gameplay is like such a important and uh, emphasized part of esports production. So identifying what the mo the exact moment is before um, before actual showable gameplay is uh, incredibly important. So for this case, we'll just pretend like we are at the loading screen. So we would say standby for uh, standby to wipe the game, standby to track game, in three, two, one, and wipe or dissolve. And then we would be on our gameplay at this point in time. Um, and then at this, uh, for the director and TD, based off of, you know, whatever their responsibilities are, um, it could, here, let's do this. Do you mind pointing the camera at me? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so at this point in time, uh, we would say, you know, uh, for League of Legends, for example, the director TD um, doesn't necessarily have too much to do with gameplay besides replays or, you know, bringing the graphics. Um, but a lot of workflows have, um, a lot of gameplay workflows have kind of uh, the TD and director pretty much hand off the show to the observer. So the observers become pretty much the in-game director. A lot of the titling now for observers is just an in-game director or in-game uh, operator. Um, so at this point in time, the observers would take over. Sometimes observers or in the in-game directors, they have their own mini switcher. Sometimes they have GPIs. Sometimes they have a string deck that has all of the buttons and different uh, effects that would need to be done. Um, whether it's through the observers or whether it's through the TD and director, it all varies wildly from production to production, but those are the different situations, uh, or that's the range of what could happen on an in-game uh, for esports. Um, in this case, I believe we don't have any GPIs or stream decks uh, for our in-game functionality. But um, leading into game, we would be looking at the observers, of course, uh, and 
we would make sure that there is a gameplay ready and then we would go we would wipe the game and then at that, at that point in time observers would be listening to the director um and kind of watching program and seeing like oh we're about to go into game and then they would get ready with all their settings you know do all the things that they need to do because most of the time you'll need to hit a lot of buttons before you uh, actually um, have to are able to observe or do any directing in game and then we would go to the gameplay state and then we would be pretty much on this gameplay state um, and just be following along with the story um, tracking casters tracking game um, and yeah we would be living in this world for the duration of the game um, while also being extremely ready for any technical difficulties because that is definitely bound to happen um, throughout a broadcast. So, um, should I throw you one? Yeah, throw you one. Stand by, we've got a pause coming up. Oh my gosh, a pause. Wow, all camera operators, get ready to uh, get over to your camera. And then at this point in time, everyone would be running to their cameras. Everyone would be, would be slightly panicking, but not really. Um, and then, uh, we would, when a pause is coming through or we see anything, um, sometimes we have the um, the convenience of knowing that a pause will come through. Let's say a player is complaining about the lighting or one of those things. So we'll have the, um, the advantage of knowing that a pause is coming through. And then we can just um, be prepared to come out of it. But in the case, like let's say, um, so actually kind of going back to it, let's say we know a pause is coming through. We'll, we'll wait for the gameplay to actually pause and we'll wait a beat to show the viewership that the game is paused. And I think that's a really important thing just to, for the pacing and so that players can, and the viewers can make, um, uh, make their conclusion in their head like, okay, the game is paused, so we can't just look at this. So it justifies our action to hop out of game. So we'd be like, oh my gosh, a pause. Three, and then you would see two, some sort of pause one, graphic. Pause. And then we would we'd be like, wait a beat. Oh my gosh, I can't believe the game's paused. And then viewers can get upset and be like, wow, another pause. And then we would come back on camera and we would show the reactions. We would show, you know, a player sitting back, being bummed. They're like, oh my gosh, the enemy team paused again. You probably didn't hear anything I said, but um, pretty much we would just, you know, show player reactions try to tell the story as much as we can. Sometimes during a pause, especially for a technical pause, you don't want to show, um, sp like whether it's sponsorship, uh, a sponsorship hardware or any th of those kind of things, you want to be very careful about what you show on camera. So the producer at that point in time would uh, be talking to tournament ops or the director at the time will be talking to tournament ops um, and just be, uh, identifying what the reason of the pause is and if it's something that needs to be protected on program or not. So let's say in the case it's um, uh, a faulty monitor, right? And let's say we have a fancy monitor sponsor. So we won't want to show the player necessarily fiddling with the monitor because most of the time you want to protect your sponsorship obligations and all that fun stuff. So you would just show the team overall in a wide and not get too close and personal because I think it's important to show the side that paused and show, tell the story that there is a pause of technical difficulties, but there's no need to um, go to a single or zoom in to a screen or any of those things. And most of the time the producer or the executive producer or coordinating producer will be very verbal about not showing the sponsorship uh, monitor being faulty. So let's say um, fast forward, you know, 20 minutes because that's how pa long pauses end up taking. Um, the pause is over. Wow, we can go back into game. So at this point in time, producers um, or director, TD, depending on the scale of the project, they'll say, um, uh, tournament ops will reach out to them, say, oh, it looks like we are good on our pause or whatever. Um, we are, uh, we're good to head back into game. So at this point in time, producer, and producer, director, depending on the scale, of course, would be working with tournament ops, and they would be working out um, when it's actually good to send them in. Um, and I guess actually before we send them in, I'll talk through a scenario of, let's say a pause is lasting too long and it does require to go to break or um, to buy time. Because um, one of the things that I kind of see a lot in production is, 
um, the communication between the tournament ops and broadcast, it's not necessarily aligned. So what ends up happening is the tournament ops, they'll say, we're almost ready um, in, let's say, like in five minutes or so. And then what will end up happening is production is like, okay, we can buy five minutes on air. We don't need to go to a commercial break. Um, and I think that what sometimes what ends up happening is sometimes the five minutes turns into 10 minutes. And not for, you know, it's, it's not tournament ops fault. Sometimes it's just the nature of a problem scaling bigger. So I think it's super important at this point in time during a pause to identify what the issue is and uh, understand what the timing is on it and getting a very clear um, understanding of how long the issue will be, will take to resolve. So um, in this case, let's say the issue can't be resolved relatively soon the producer tournament ops, they'll be talking through, and they'll be like, this is a very big issue. Um, so at that point in time, you kind of go off the script a little bit, you go off the rundown and you ad lib, and you'll have the, the talent um, talking uh, in kind of just tap dancing, as they call it, um, and just buying time. Uh, and at a certain point in time, the producer, director, TD, whatever, uh, depending on the scale, of course, I'll just keep saying it just to say it. Um, they'll end up making a call and they'll say, you know, we have to, this is a big problem. We'll have to go to commercial um, just to buy some more time for this issue to be resolved. So at this point in time, um, the producer will, or director, they'll go into the ear of the talent that ideally isn't talking at the point, at that point in time. And they'll communicate to them. Looks like we're gonna have a pause. We will, we'll, we'll need to toss it to break. Um, after your point, um, I'll have X caster or whatever toss us to break. Um, so let's say you know in that case they're talking to the not the the person who doesn't or the talent that does not deal with um, the tosses catches. Um, so communicate to one talent who's not speaking, then communicate to the other talent that is uh, that just wraps up their point. You'll say, hey, um, after um, this next point uh, after this last point here, you can toss us out the break. Um, and then at that point in time, uh, director TD, we, we would already be communicating with the producer. We know we're going to break. So we'd say, stand by to go to break, everybody. It looks like we are going to a commercial break. Let's get a five clock ready. Um, oh, look at, so on it. Um, so we'd say, let's get, a, let's get our, um, this one. Cool. So let's get our five clock ready. Um, stand, and then we can just. Um, cool. Yeah, and then you can just throw that out. You can just animate that right now. So we just say stand by to get our five clock ready, and stand by music. And then Castro would be like, um, "Looks like our technical issues are um, definitely not resolving anytime soon. So we're gonna head out to commercial break, and we'll see you back after the break. Um, stand by to dissolve to." Uh, graphics, stand by music, in three, two, one, dissolve, music. So at this point in time, we would be on our commercial with music, and then we would just be working with the producer uh, and working with all the all, all the creatives kind of involved on how we're gonna kind of restructure this, uh, this new kind of um, block that we're pretty much creating. So at this point in time, during the commercial break, in this kind of ad lib scenario, you would be working very closely within your whole production crew of what is the plan when you come back on air. And at, for 99% of the time, the producer's um, talking with tournament ops and for the first, let's say it's a five minute clock, the producer will be talking with tournament ops for the first four minutes of the clock. So you as production crew, um, outside of the producer who's, not ta who's talking to tournament ops, you're just trying to hear what the producer is talking. You're hearing the one side of the conversation or both sides if you're lucky. And you get to understand what's happening and you try to think about what the producer will want so you can just be ready for what is a last minute kind of adjustment. So at this, at this point in time, uh, you, it looks like you know, uh, the, the producer is like, okay, talking with tournament ops, and it's like, okay, well, we just resolved the issue as you went to commercial break, because that's the cruel beast of live broadcast, is as soon as you go to commercial break, the issue does resolve. So let's say they did fix the issue, so the producer at this point in time would kind of communicate that out to the whole group, or the director of TD, 
if they are playing the producer role for this scale of the project, they'll be communicating out. They'll say, all right, everybody, it looks like the issue has been resolved. Uh, we'll be coming back on camera to our talent. Um, we won't need to name them just for the pacing of it. We already, uh, we won't take much longer for, to get back in the game. Um, so we'll come back on camera. Uh, talent will just address the issue and say that we are good to go back into game and um, we'll just get into gameplay. Cool. So stand by, uh, stand by to lose the music, stand by to dissolve back to our talent, stand by to cue talent in five, four, three, two, one, lose the music, dissolve, cue talent. They would say, hey, welcome back, everybody. It looks like we had all of our issues fixed over the break. Thank you for your patience. And let's get back into game. And stand by for gameplay in three, two, one, track game, dissolve. Um, and then, yeah, going going pretty much off of that, it's um, also thank you for cutting this pip in. I really do appreciate it. Y'all are amazing. Um, so yeah, at this point in time, it would just be getting back into game and not, because the one of the big biggest things about um, uh, production in you last thing you want is people waiting on live production. Like you should be you like if you have to go straight out of a com uh, countdown clock um, in commercial, if you have to go straight out of the commercial full screen to gameplay because it's ready, I would say do it because the last thing you want to do is delay gameplay because of broadcast reasons. Um, so in that case, we are back into the normal realm of uh, being in game, no issues, no more pauses, because pauses are definitely a very uh, um, diverse and messy uh, monster. Um, so we're on gameplay right now. Observers would be doing their calls. They would pretty much as um, I guess if you if y'all want we can do uh, if y'all want we can do a couple of um, uh, just observer calls. We can just do a couple of mock things. So. Um, we would just be, let's say we're on Observer 1, um, and wow, I can't believe a kill just happened. Um, so we're going to run through, I guess, just a replay yeah, yeah. workflow we'll, in we'll game? Do, we'll do a replay from Observer 1 to Observer 2 cool. of something that just happened. Do you remember those real quick? Uh, we'll just stick in this one. All right, so oh, that was an amazing kill over there, okay? And then Observer 1 would be like, okay, uh, could you give me a replay of that Observer 2? Great. And then Observer 2 is setting up that replay. And when everything is ready, we'll just hit pause for the time being. Cool. Cool. And so at this point in time, we would see, um, I'm just going to quickly go to Observer 2 just to show it. So we would see our replay state on program. It um, It's paused and ready to go at the first frame just before the combat. So we would just be, we would be sitting on that paused frame. And then depending on the workflow on the production, it would either be standby to wipe to replay and wipe replay, roll replay. Um, or in some cases, in some productions, the observer will call it. So observer one, would you kindly call for uh, going to our replay? You could say, um, actually, Kevin, you can. All right, I'll do this. OK, so we got replay ready. So observer two. Observer two, tell observer one you're ready. your replay is ready. Replay ready. Then observer one, you tell director, replay ready. Ready, replay. Dissolve, replay. Go. And we're in a replay. What an amazing replay. Carmish doesn't know what she's doing. Wow. Gets the siege menu. I can't believe she leveled up there. <laughs> cool. And then um, at, at the, once the replay is done, the Observer 2. Back to live. Beautiful. And back to live. Perfect. Just in time to see that trade in top lane. Um, so that's pretty much the flow of kind of how it goes. There's a couple of more effects that we would want to do during uh, gameplay. Sometimes it revolves around like a live uh, live camera pip like what we got right now in the bottom left on program. Um, sometimes it will be a observer pip. Um, and it all kind of is based on what stories we want to tell and um, what the goals are of the match, you know, of what stories we want to um, show. So we would be pretty much on this gameplay state. We don't need to. We don't need to spend the whole. We don't need to watch actually the whole game play out. But just for the sake of you know, kind of talking through it, we would just be on this gameplay state. Of course, we would just stay till the very end. I think um, a good thing to talk about, uh, just for I guess in terms of League of Legends, the way that um, what ends up happening is there's there's 
uh, based on the game um, that is being broadcasted, so League of Legends, for example, I think it's it's good to just address this right now so we can all kind of talk about um, the differences between games and where the climax is on when the, the win moment happens. I think it's very important to identify that all games are very, very different. So League of Legends, for example, we will have the final team fight, right? It's not necessarily when the game ends. So how do we capture that energy, that moment for when the win happens? So some effects that uh, productions have done to like address this mo this thing where you don't want to take a you don't want to take the viewership off of gameplay, but you want to show the win the technically like you know the win moment reaction. Because the final team fight, everyone knows what, when you win that final team fight, that's the win. That's when all the emotions of the player finally comes out. Till then, they're just so um, absorbed in the game and just competing. So to address that, a lot of productions have done, you know, bringing up player cameras uh, along the bottom of the screen of the team that just did it. Um, but I think what's most important is that you don't take away from the gameplay because. Um, you never want to like offend the viewership by taking the gameplay away. Even though we know that the game has been won off of that team fight, you still have to go th through the formality of showing the gameplay all the way through till the end, till you see the victory screen or see the. In this case, it would be the Nexus explode, right? So it's it's good to address that that all games are different, but the moment when the player knows they win. You do want to you do want to style your broadcast and build your broadcast with effects that complement that moment, whether it's um, some games they've they, they've trained the viewership where you can cut to a camera full out of that and then cut back to game and it's not offensive. For League of Legends, for example, there has been there's been a lot of years within its broadcast history, and it's not a common practice to cut to a camera full while on gameplay to show a reaction. So to alleviate that, but also show player reactions, there'll be um, player cameras that come along the bottom of the screen, pretty much uh, on this side of the player pip, near the center of the screen and bottom. We can reenact so the victory if you want. Huh? We can reenact the victory if you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know, play it for here. So, oh, stand by for a red team win, just play it for yeah. you. So th pretty much this, this right here is, oh my gosh, the director, producer they'd be like oh my gosh i can't believe the where i here comes the win everybody camera operator is ready stand by to uh wipe out or stand by to push back and push it back dissolve on camera you would go through the wind music and bring in the music so this would be a victory track or some sort of different track that the a1 would be aware of and then you'd be bouncing between you know i think common practice is definitely show the winners first so show the winners oh my gosh they all jump up Wow, we did it, we won. Um, and then uh, um, I think a very important thing is to identify uh, what you wanna show and what's like important to show. If the story wasn't necessarily, um, if the story and the direction that you wanna go with um, the broadcast and what the uh, creatives and what they wanna tell is uh, victories, then you wouldn't necessarily try to focus on the disappointment. But let's say it was a really, really big upset, you would change and alter the way you were cutting these live shots in to accommodate that story and really support that storyline of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, um, in this case, it would be like Splice or whatever. I can't believe Splice threw that game at the very last second. They must be like so disappointed. So to accommodate that, you show the initial win and kind of like euphoric moment of the team pulling out the win at the last second. But then you would also uh, try to emphasize, um, you know, the disappointment, heartbreak, all these things. And it's so uh, it's really important to be in touch with what happened in the game, what the storyline of the game was, and try to reflect that in your shot sequence when you hop out of game. Um, just so that um, when you when you come out of it, the viewership isn't, they don't feel like they um, are kind of being stolen a moment of, uh, like a moment. Um, 
fr from the broadcast because like let's say the, everyone everyone knows what what happened in the game it's important to show the story um so that the viewers are like oh my gosh this person must be so salty and like you want to show the salty person because i'm sure everybody's wondering what the salty person's doing or sorry for the the term salty or upset um <laughs> it's an informal term um so pretty much you'd be bouncing based off of reactions whatever um and then at, at a certain point, I think that it's 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 definitely a feel thing of when you feel you've gotten all you can out of it, and when um, you're just showing a person wrapping up a keyboard. Um, so it's a balancing act of like what's a disappointed person uh, wrapping up a keyboard or unplugging a mouse, and what's a person just unplugging a mouse. Um, so you would just kind of feel it out, feel out the moment, and then from there you would probably most likely return back onto camera for your casters, and then they would toss out. So we would say stand by to come back on camera. Producer or director, they would be communicating with the talent. Say stand by to come back on camera. In five, four, three, two, one, fade out the music and dissolve. So we would be back on camera with our caster. They'd be like, wow, what a game. I can't believe that actually just happened. Um, some um, Sometimes the the way they do it, um, the way broadcast will do it, they'll wrap up on the caster. Sometimes they'll wrap up on the analyst desk. It all kind of varies, but there will most likely be a post game to some degree. Um, so let's say in this case, the casters are going to do their wrap up in final thoughts, and then they'll toss over to our analysts. Um, so at this point in time, we have our casters. They're like, "Wow, I can't believe we just watched that amazing game." and um, wow, the the observers really killed it there. Great job, observers. Um, totally, casters would absolutely compliment observers every single time, <laughs> and they'd say, "Wow, the production crew was so good." Um, so then, at that point in time, the caster would be like, "Well, that'll do it for us over here. Let's send it back over to the analyst to break that game down." So at that, that's the pretty much what the on-air talent will be saying. What we'll be saying in the control room is. Stand by for the toss, everybody. Heading back over to the analyst desk. Um, stand by for analyst mics. Stand by for a little bit of music, or you know, depending on the f the way the broadcast goes or how the production likes to do things. But sometimes they'll bring in music just to bump in the analyst. Sometimes they won't. Um, but it's all based off of feel. But you know, in let in this case, we'll just say they're not doing music. So we'll say stand by to uh, stand by for the toss to our analysts. And then we'll just be going off a verbal cue from our casters. They'll say, that'll do it for us. Um, and back over to y'all in the analyst desk. And then we would say, stand by for analysts. And dissolve. And stand by names. And animate names. Lovely. Already on it. So good. Cool. And then uh, stand by to lose the names. And lose the names. Cool. Um, and then pretty much the way that this will go, um, it'll be you will rename your analysts you'll um they'll do their initial reactions so most likely it'll be on camera they'll cut back and forth you'll be like oh my gosh i can't believe that was such a crazy game and then the other person will be like yeah me too that was really crazy um so kind of just going back and forth between those and then um they would do any kind of supporting replays or b-roll um so let's say we we were able to bank a, a some b-roll throughout the match of you know the crazy big upset and then just bear with me we'll just be going to our amazing observer 2 um b-roll um we would just say like um the analysts they would just be talking and they would they would say like oh it was such a disappointing uh dragon and then we then in the production room that would be like our cue we'd be like oh we have the dragon b-roll so stand by stand by for our b-roll and in this world, we'll pretend like it's a VT. I'll just call a VT, but don't worry about it. You can just pretend hit the button, and I'll, I'll be very uh, grateful for it. Um, so we be say, so we'll say stand by, um, stand by VTA or VTB or EVSC or whatever your production is calling their VT. So it would be stand by for VT, stand by for some music. In three, two, one, roll VT and music. And then if you were a director and there was a separated TD, you would say dissolve. But in this case, it's just me. So you don't necessarily need to say it because you're just saying it to yourself. Um, so then we would have our music, our B-roll would be playing. We would have music. Uh, 
Talon would be talking on top of it. They'd be like, yeah, that dragon really was sleeping the whole match. <laughs> um, and then from there, we would say uh, pretty much the, the way that I usually kind of will do B-roll when, uh, when I'm directing and TDing and stuff, it'll be pretty much based off of the what the talent are saying. So as the talent are wrapping up their thoughts or you feel like they're they're pretty much done with their initial point about the dragon or whatever. You don't need to play. You don't need to feel obligated to play the whole B-roll out. Um, and then you can just apologize to your observers for capture, making them capture like you know a minute worth of dragon B-roll. So you'll just say, "Oh, okay, cool." So you, okay, so yeah, you would just, <laughs> so yeah, you would just say, um, "Cool." Looks like um, looks like they're good with their their talk on the dragon. So stand by to come back on camera. Stand by to lose the music. And three, two, one, dissolve. Lose the music. Um, so at this point in time, they would be kind of talking, going through their final points. They would probably do some sort of full screen wrap up or lower thirds uh, for player stats. Um, so let's say in this case, we'll do like a standings. Um, we'll do like another standings kind of thing. Um, so sta oh, we'll do this one. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, so for this, uh, let's actually, um, cool. So, if you want on uh, on Snoop Cam, do you think that you can point that at the wall, and then we can have that fun little uh, background thing? So, usually, when you kind of go 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 through these kind of studio environments, you'll just you'll have a key term that you'll say to the camera op of like. Um, Stand, stand by to go for lights, stand by to go for your wall, or something like that, so that the camera operator knows that you're going to have them point at something really random. So stand by for our graphics, stand by uh, camera, thank you very much. Cool. Stand by camera, whatever, Snoop Cam, and stand by graphic in three, two, one, dissolve, and animate. Perfect. And that, that, that was really good what you did there. So um, especially as an operator, there's a lot of times where you'll just, uh, the director TD, they'll call for things as a formality, but um, as an operator, you know that when, when we go to this, um, uh, this wall, we're gonna do a graphic. <laughs> so in that case, like just when you see the wall, animate the graphic. And I think I can, I can safely say for most um, director and TDs, they'll always appreciate it if you just do what they were gonna say anyways. Um, and then if they get mad, then whatever. <laughs> Say sorry. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much this point in time. They'll be talking about this graphic. And then as they kind of wrap up their thoughts, they're like, oh, I can't believe team one and team five are still tied for the standings. That's unbelievable. So stand by to come back on camera. Stand by to lose our graphic. And let's lose the graphic and dissolve. Back on camera. And then, you know, kind of what we talked about earlier, talent, uh, they can go based off of cues from the producer, but it really depends on the workflow and how things are set. But it all depends based on workflow and what, um, uh, what technology and what equipment you have available and what people feel comfortable with within the broadcast. Um, so pretty much from there, we'll be going, um, I guess we can just go for our, our toss off of the analyst desk to our commercial. And then we can kind of stop down and talk about any of the things that we kind of came up. So um, as we kind of toss to commercial, let's um, stand by for our coming up lower third. And then, um, so here's our talent. They'll be like, well, that'll do us. That'll, that'll do it for game one. And this is exactly why I'm not a talent. So that'll do it for, that'll do it for game one. Uh, thanks. Uh, great. Wow, what an amazing game. Um, coming up next, and animate lower third, and start and stand by um, to bleed in some bump out music and bleed in the music. So then, then we'd have some fun music as they're doing this toss out over the lower third. They'll say, and coming up next, we have uh, game two where Spy is uh, going to play against Vitality once again. Um, I don't know why they're playing again, but they will be playing again. And then let's lose lower third. And then at this point in time, we would have our camera do a pull out or some sort of thing, you know giving a visual indication to people. But if you're in a two box and you're doing a remote workflow, then just use your imagination that the two box is pulling out. Um, so at this point in time, they would say, and coming up next, blah, 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 blah. And we'll see you after the break. So stand by for our commercial break. And then you can actually pre-reveal that one. So, so what I pretty much did there is 
um, since we're only working off of uh, one graphics channel, um, this is me just using my own, just my DSKs. I'm killing my channel and then I'm asking for a pre-reveal so that we can have the, the full screen already loaded up. Or if you want, you can just animate on top. It's whatever the producer or creatives behind it prefer and would like for their vision. So in this case, let's say it's, um, we're going to it um, on a on a dissolve and it's already pre-revealed. So we'll say, so I'm gonna, and they do their final toss out. Oh, we'll be right out of the break, right after this. Stand by music, stand by full screen. In three, two, one, music, full screen. And that, that's it. And then we're on commercial break. And then at this point in time, we would be talking about the next block and what's coming up. Um, and then you would do that for five games. And sometimes there would be variations on what the blocks would be. Um, but that's pretty much it in terms of communication. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if anyone has any questions or if anyone wants to dive deeper into any of the specific moments, um, just since we kind of, kind of, uh, since we kind of went through the whole workflow of everything, if anyone does have any questions or whatever, um, feel free to ask, and then we can kind of just talk through, um, in specifics or in using examples, we can kind of talk through what um, what we would do in different scenarios. So yeah. 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 Sounds good.
One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. The energy is changing here, man. That's what I want to hear. Ho, ho. <laughs> we'll be, uh, okay. So, folks, we have around 20, uh, 15 to 20, but we want to open this up to, obviously, questions about what you've just experienced. Could you put that chair down, please? Thank you very much. Uh, an experience of, of what you've just experienced and, obviously, any questions that you might have um, that come to mind. Don't be shy. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite production role to work? Um, I would say directing. Um, just just because uh, I think that like I'm I I'm a very I have like a lot of um, desire for like uh, whether it's me being like a control freak or. Um, me being really interested in the storytelling and really trying to cater the sequencing of camera shots or the pacing of different things um, and kind of like progress getting the broadcast to flow well with what the viewership's expectations are and what the desires are of the viewers. Um, I feel like I, I really do enjoy that and um, I care about it so much that I feel more inclined, and it does it does uh, turn into kind of my more uh, favorite uh, role, I guess, in the control room. But I do love TDing um, in terms of like the building and just um, working within the video production switcher and uh, problem solving. I feel like that's like one of the biggest things, especially with TDing and um, working with the production switcher. Um, how do I make this thing do this? And how do I make it look good? How do I make it look clean? And how do I make it look fluid and make sense um, while not breaking anything, of course? You mentioned earlier that you uh, was a part of the Apex team at one point. What what did you do with the Apex team? And yeah, that's the first part of the question. Yeah. Um, so for Apex, um, for the first studio show for the Apex Legends Global Series, I uh, directed and um, oversaw pretty much the whole studio kind of uh, configuration for that. And then um, from that, going into the online tournaments of the Autumn Circuit, Winter Circuit, um, just directing that show and uh, working closely with producers on kind of delivering on what that show was um, and what it was kind of evolving throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, I know the that was a very interesting time in terms of uh, broadcast because it was everyone taking a studio show and then turning it into an online show. Second part, uh, me being a fan of Apex since like the first day and ever watching any of the uh, esports that there is on Twitch or whatever it is, any of the VODs or anything, it feels it feels like it's a little bit under bu under budgeted. Uh, esports for Apex, it feels like there's something that isn't up to par as to like League or Valorant or anything like that right now. Do yes. You, like, is, do you have that kind of opinion as well? It feels like it's not got as much into it as any other game at the minute. Yeah. Um, I, do, I do think that like for most games um, in esports, there's always a different allocation in terms of budget, and there's always uh, different hurdles that um, the production production team has to face, uh, whether it's sponsor obligations or sponsorship or dealing with marketing or legal or doing any of those things that um, might give a production like hurdles to overcome. And definitely one of the things uh, is uh, that happened, I think, with Apex in my opinion, is that Apex kind of, uh, it's kind of more official tournament format that got released um, in terms of its production. It released probably at the most um, 
fluid time and broadcast workflows. So I think the timing of that one made that one made the kind of launch of the Apex Global Series or Apex Legends Global Series a little uh, shaky. And I feel like it kind of catching its ground was always something where it's always trying to find the best new workflow, the best new online workflow that works for more people. And people uh, just like learning, kind of like um, developing it. So I think it was just, it was a combination of things where it's, you know, a little budget, a little um, uh, trying to catch deadlines, a little, all, a little bit of everything, yeah. Quite a slapdash attempt. It, it felt, it feels like quite a slapdash attempt in terms of how they produce it. It's like really, it's not yeah. low effort, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any more for any more? Um, so to get to the point of being able to, uh, to TD, what was your process in getting to that? And how long did it like take you? Did you just dive into the deep end and just do it? Or like, what was your process? Yeah, um, so I guess uh, getting, getting into it, um, so I started as an observer, and then on my days off, I would be heading into the control room when the any of the dark days the studio had. And I would just mess around on the switcher for, it was probably about a year and a half of just messing around by myself. And just like learning, because um, I didn't learn to use a production uh, a video switcher. Um, in any formal aspect. It was a very informal, just going um, on my dark day and going in, just learning it and building things for fun, working on timelines, um, and uh, trying to pretty much replicate what an eSports show is um, on my own show file. And um, that, was, that was pretty much the, the process, is just going in days off and just going at it for however much time I can get on the switcher as possible on any of the days that it wasn't being used and just making sure I didn't break it for the next show. <laughs> um, what's the most difficult problem you've come across um, mid-broadcast and you know how did you resolve it? Um. I think um, for difficulty on issues arising, I think when it's, uh, not to say when it's too difficult, when it's a extremely difficult problem, it ends up not becoming my problem. <laughs> but usually in terms of sev uh, the severity of something, if something's extremely bad in my eyes of like what a problem could be on broadcast, it would most likely be solved by the tech manager or the engineers or tournament ops. Um, and it would be mostly a reactionary kind of like, how do I mitigate how this looks on air? Um, so worst case, um, probably the, the, the worst thing that has ever happened, which is um, a trip, a nice trip down memory lane for me, I guess, is um, there was a, there, there was a moment where our, um, we thought our our program was just outputting bars. Um, so this was during, um, I think it was um, at the time it was called uh, LCS Academy or whatever it is. Uh, whatever it is now, it's uh, Challenger Series or whatever uh, for League of Legends. And our, our program on in the gallery or control room, it went to bars and uh, of course, you know, when program goes to bars, everybody's looking at the TD and they're like, uh, don't be on bars, uh, get off bars. Um, uh, and me knowing that I didn't hit bars, I uh, was, you know, I, I, mentioned, I, I, I said, we're not on bars, we are currently on gameplay. Um, and as everybody kind of is looking at program, they're like, you're on bars. Um, so what in the moment everybody you know panic is ensues and i think it's the most important thing you can do as um a technical director or director is make 
make people feel like everything's okay. You know that meme with the dog and it's, this is fine? That is like exactly what you need to do as um, anyone in the control room really, but especially um, the director or TD is ensure people that everything is fine. So um, we s I saw that Bars was on the program in the control room or the gallery and then I knew that on my switcher, it was punched on the gameplay state. So I said, you know, to everyone, everything's fine. We're on gameplay. Um, I went to my router panel. I routed up what the actual transmission out was, and it was gameplay. So I said, transmission, everything is fine, um, and we are pushing gameplay. Everything is fine. So just reiterating and reassuring, I think it's the most important thing is reassuring people that everything's fine. Um, and if it wasn't fine, it's good to tell people like, this is what we need to do or whatever. And it's good to have like a very clear and um, calm voice about what is going on and how to problem solve it. But in our case, everything was fine and it's more so just clearing the air on the panic that's ensuing in the control room. Ju so just staying calm, saying everything's fine. I just I just checked the transmission out. Everything is fine. Gameplay is pushing. Audio is pushing. We're all good. Um, and then just going from there and just kind of figuring out. So if it wasn't uh, the switcher and transmission's fine, why are there why is there bars on our, our program monitor in the control room? So I think what ended up happening is um, in our uh, video control, the one of the uh, controls that the, the VC had was uh, to put bars into certain monitors, and one of them was the program monitor in the control room. So we just identified that, and we worked off of a different monitor for the time being, and we solved the problem. Um, in terms of an actual really big problem that happened is um, uh, our audio mixer died <laughs> in for worlds. Um, it was for, and it was right before the, um, it was probably an hour before opening ceremony, I think for um, 20, uh, 2018 or something like that. Um, the, the mixer just, uh, the board just went dead and we didn't know what to do. So what we ended up doing is we luckily we had a international we had an international partner there who had their truck so we uh, repatched everything through their their board uh, and we just did we put our A1 in their truck and we just made it work that way but it was uh, that's probably the worst thing that happened and what you can do in that situation is just not add to the fire and just stay calm and just say it'll all work out <laughs> because that's all you really have control over is the environment in the room. Um, 2016 MSI. Funnily enough, I was um, the tape producer for EVS in that event, and JD was actually the technical director. And we can actually search this up. We will probably show it up later on. I don't know if we could do it. Um, it was on YouTube. So Shox was having an interview with Wolf's uh, SKT, and. Me being the absolute idiot I am, I walked in because we don't. I think I was observing. I finished observing. I walked into the control room and I, you know, I was talking to colleagues, giving everyone high fives, fist bumps, good show, good show, kind of thing. And then me being the idiot, I walked over to uh, my I, a buddy of mine who was doing the tape producing or tape operating on the EVS uh, machine, and I was like, oh, it would be a shame if I hit this button. Right? So I walked. I was like, <laughs> and I actually hit the button, and it was playing a tape recording of an interview. And obviously, it just jumped to like a poor screen of a replay, so it was just League of Legends, fr straight from an interview. And then from the front, I remember I heard, what the, what the hell? And I was like, oh no. And luckily, we had JD here with his quick fingers. You, I think you jumped straight to dashing, I think. Yeah, it's, so that's my biggest mistake. And funny enough, it was with JD, but thank you to JD, who actually, <laughs> you know, he recouped the situation. But yeah. yeah, we'll bring that up sometime, we'll show you. Yeah, I think, um, one of the best things you can do in broadcast is always is have a slight level of paranoia that something's going to go wrong. So anytime there's a playback, anytime there's 
a camera anytime there's anything you um not to make you all feel fear when you're ever whenever you're in live broadcast unless i'm there but just uh, just to always be aware because if you're as long as you run through that scenario at least like lightly in your head or recently then you can um be as prepared as possible if something does happen because i think um last thing you want to do is panic right so to not panic you just need to be prepared so to be prepared you just need to be a little paranoid so to you just run through whenever you go to a source you just think what could go wrong here and how can i solve it so the whenever i go to a tape i always have a backup plan so if the tape doesn't if the tape pauses if the tape jumps if something happens if we a uh, camera feed goes down if anything goes down what is my backup and most of the time you have like a living hold you have a logo you have something that you can go a wide shot so always keep that in the back of your head not to make you feel fear constantly whenever you're working in live broadcast but always be prepared whenever you go to something be prepared to go to somewhere else I also wasn't going to throw you under the bus like that, but I'm glad you brought up the story. <laughs> We've got time for one last question. Um, are there any situations where you have uh, absolutely panicked, you know, and everything starts going wrong, or are you always just collected? Um, I, I think, um, I think I have like an. Uh, I'm not sure if something's wrong with me or whatever, but I do, um, I do, I, I think I, um, I tend to just kind of laugh it off and it, I try not to actually laugh, but I try to just remind myself that like, um, so yeah, I, do, I don't panic, but yeah, I, I pretty much just like, will laugh to myself and just be like, I'm helpless right now, or we're helpless like right now, and we have nothing we can do to control it. Um, and that's that's the nature of it. And it's like, you're just along for the ride at that point, and you might as well enjoy the ride. So if things are going hectically wrong and everything's on fire, just like, enjoy that you're warm. <laughs> when the ship's sinking, keep playing the violin. Is that what exactly. it is? Folks, put your hands together for JD and Kevin. Thank you. I'm sure you'll agree that was super inspiring, really engaging, and a insight into uh, some world-class production action. Um, that is uh, the last lecture of Industry Week 22 for all of us. Uh, but the fun doesn't end here, because at 6 o'clock today, we've got Gamer Gamer tonight. Uh, those of you that are over 18 and have a... <laughs> and <laughs> and have a, uh, a, a stomach for... Um, intense comedy. Uh, please do join tonight. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be really, really cool. It's going to be great. Get involved. I'll see you guys on the other side in a bit. Bye.